Hello, everyone, and welcome back. As always, I'm your girl, Candy Washington. So before we dive into today's episode, which is just a fun Bravo TV catch up, we'll be talking about the Valley. Are you watching? Are you not? Vanderpump Rules. We're even going to get into Potomac and also some Summer House. Are you guys watching Summer House this season? So before we dive in, go ahead and like, subscribe, and share. So with that, let me know in the chat box what you want to talk about first. Do you want to talk about Summer House, Vanderpump Rules, Real Housewives of Potomac, or The Valley? What do you want me to cover first? Whoever puts it in the chat box first, that is what we shall cover. So let me know, you guys, and let me know how you're doing. You know, be sure to, you know, say hi in the chat box. You know, where are you listening from? What are your thoughts on everything going on in pop culture? I know there's been raids and a lot of crazy stuff. So just put it down below on what you guys are watching and what you're thinking in pop culture. Kate Middleton, what are your thoughts on her? Hey, Deb. Deb says the valley. Hey, sweetheart. All right. So that's what we will start with. We are going to start with the valley. So in all transparency, the first episode I thought of the valley, I actually thought it was really good. And I felt guilty for even watching. And I felt guilty for thinking it was good because we know like Jax and Kristen and Brittany have all been exposed for saying very horrible, racist things and also doing very horrible and racist things, which is why all three of them got fired from Vanderpump Rules in the first place. So I'm going to be honest in saying that I felt very guilty watching because I definitely did not want to support them, but I did end up watching. And I thought the first episode was pretty good. I thought it was funny. I thought it was engaging. I thought, wow, it's a lot different than what I thought it was going to be because the people that were introduced, they were kind of fun, a different season of life, and they were all pretty cool and interesting people. Now I'm going to do a deep dive into all of the couples and what I think is going on. But the second episode though, hot trash dumpster fire, hot trash dumpster fire. And when I say trash, I'm not calling any person trash, not in a derogatory way. I just mean it's like a dumpster trash fire. Okay. To me, Brittany is just as evil as Jax. And we're going to get into it. Let's get into it. Let me go through each person. So Luke and Kristen, and I'm going to break down what I think about all of that. Okay. Luke, I'm going to be honest with you. He gives me, and I hope, I don't want to get my, my, my YouTube docs, but I'm just going to be honest. He gives me serial killer vibes. Like Luke, like there is a ticky, ticky, boom, boom in him where I feel like he has like dead bodies in his basement or something. Like there's something fundamentally off with Luke. He just gives me creepy guy who lives in like Colorado or Utah, wherever the hell he lives in on a farm. Like I just feel there's something inherently creepy about him. Jax, like him or not, he reads people for filth. He reads people for filth. And he reads Luke for filth as well. I do think there's something ticky, ticky, boom, something really off from Luke. Now, Kristen, she's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs too, but in a different way. I'm going to compartmentalize the racism with Faith. I know it's not right, but in order to talk about it, I have to just put it that in a little bucket. Kristen, I think, is very insecure, very... Um, looking for validation, looking for love, just kind of, you know, kind of like that type of lost forever girl. You know what I mean? She seems very sad, very desperate, very needy energy, very, very lost girl energy to me. Now, the whole storyline of Kristen and Luke trying to have a baby, do we think that's true or do we think that's just for a storyline? Either way, I think it's absolutely ridiculous and a hot mess of a storyline. Number one, Kristen, you met this guy, you banged him in the bushes. 
literally two days after the guy you were dating, Alex, kicked you out of the house you were sharing, made you sell your house, and then now you're living in an apartment somewhere. You know what I mean? So that to me is absolutely crazy and bonkers. She should have taken some time to heal, get herself together, and then move on in a proper way rather than just going, you know, to the next guy and being like, let's have a baby. I get it. In our society, there's this fake, false, toxic pressure for women. Oh my gosh, you're 35 without a kid. You're 40 without a kid. We're 41. Whoa, you'll never have, like, it's so ridiculous, especially in 2024. Like, stop it. So if this narrative is true or this storyline of her having wanting a child is true, it's harmful. It's harmful to other women her age who may feel similar to her watching her do a very destructive thing because she's not wanting to have a child because she wants to do what's in the best interest for the actual child, which honestly, if you're going to do it the way Kristen is, you might as well do what Lala is doing and get a sperm donor. And just have the child on your own rather than having a child with this person who you're in a fake relationship with. I think they're in some type of situationship. They made it very clear that Luke was only living in L.A. for filming. He said 99.9% .9 of his life is in Utah, Colorado, I Iowa, Idaho, wherever the hell he's from. So he's clearly just in L.A. for filming. And this is the person you want to bring a life into the world with? It's not cute. It's not funny. It's a hot, hot mess. And it's sending the wrong message to other women who probably feel that same societal and personal pressure that if you're not that by a certain age, if you don't have a kid, if you don't have a man, somehow you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're behind. There's something wrong with you, which totally is garbage. I don't care how old you are. You don't have to have a child to validate who you are. I don't care how old you are. You don't have to have a man or a woman to validate who you are. So get that garbage out of your mind. So I think that's a very dangerous narrative that they're playing with. There's something really off with Luke. What, to me, he just seems like, I don't know, there's something a little wackadoodle going on there. And Kristen, I do think Kristen is doing the best she can. Like, you know, I do think that she's in therapy or going to therapy. She's trying to get her life back in order. But this is the wrong road. Wrong road. Now, when it comes to Jackson Br Brittany, this is the thing with Jackson Brittany that gets me. The reason why I said Brittany is just as evil as Jax is, number one, she pretends to be like, oh, just rotten hell and we want grandma's beer and butter and cheese. To me, it's such it's so fake. And you can even see the cracks starting to show with her co-stars. Like the other women on the show were like, yeah, and Britney was just like making excuses for Jax. Like that's kind of whack too. Where it's like she makes all these excuses for Jack. People just say, oh, Britney's an angel for putting up with him. That's also a very dangerous narrative. Women are not angels for tolerating abusive men. They're victims. <laughs> you know, if someone was like, oh, Candy, you're an angel for putting up with a guy who cheats on you, who calls you fat, who disrespects you. You're an angel for putting up with him. Why are they selling this narrative that Britney is some angel because she lets a man play her and disrespect her every single day? That's not an angel. That's a doormat. That's low self-esteem. That is um, toxic and that's unhealthy. That's not an angel. That's also a very toxic narrative where it's like, oh, you are allowing someone to disrespect you publicly. That makes you an angel because you take them back. Another issue I have with Brittany is she weaponizes her religion. You know, it's like where they they stand. Look, God said forgive, so I'm going to forgive them. Well, no. Yes, you you forgive, but that doesn't mean you allow somebody back in your life. That's another storyline narrative that I don't like about these two. But the reason why I think Brittany is just as evil as Jax is because in the second episode, I don't care who you are. Jax was dead wrong for inviting Alex to boys night, knowing that Luke was going to be there, knowing what happened between Alex and Kristen. Jax, we all know he's been evil. 
but I'm only but I'm only going to talk about his evilness for the valley, okay? Because that's what we're talking about right now. He is evil, diabolical, and super super scary. And this show is a dumpster trash fire. Every word out of his mouth is Kristen's crazy, this, that, and a third. He's bad mouthing her to the ex. He's bad mouthing her to her new boyfriend. He's bad mouthing her to the entire group. It's really sick. Like, it's super sick to watch. And, like, it's not funny and it's not entertaining. Like, to be honest, the first episode I was into, the second episode, I was like, y'all are evil. It was just too calculated. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just my tolerance level, but I was like, I don't want to watch this crap, you know, of you just going around maligning this girl. Oh, you called her washed up. You called her this and this. And Kristen sleeps with all of the, every single friend I have. She slept with him. I wouldn't have any friends. And like bringing Alex there and like trash talking her. It was just so nasty and disgusting. And I'm not a Kristen, necess- I'm not a Kristen fan by any means. But just like humanity, just like common decency, I was like, this isn't entertainment. This is just trash and a dumpster fire. But the way Brittany was just as evil was, so then they're having the girls night, right? And Brittany, bring, obviously very scripted and planned, Brittany brings up the fact that Alex is going to be there to Kristen. I don't think Kristen knew, but obviously Brittany bringing it up to Kristen was scripted and planned by Jackson production. Cause that's another thing. The work is showing it's so produced. It's not even funny. Um, but I actually think Kristen had every right to be pissed off. I would be pissed off. Why are you inviting a man who told me I was washed up, who broke up with me, who made me sell my house I move in with him and then he kicks me out the moment I get fired. And then he talks trash about me. I wouldn't want you to invite him to be hanging out with like my new group of friends on my new show. Oh, hell no. And for Brittany to then, and they left it on that cliffhanger because she's defending Jax to throw something in Kristen's face. She reveals something Kristen says about one of the other husbands of the group. And being like, well, Kristen, you're a pot stirrer. You're this or that. I'm, excuse me? Like, we were just talking about apples. And now you're talking about oranges because you don't want to admit the fact that your apples are poison. What in the hell has anything that Kristen has gossiped about or said or may have repeated that somebody else has said or done have to do with the fact that your trash box husband invited her ex over as an F you to her. I'm confused. These are two different conversations. These are two different situations. But for Brittany to then do that to Kristen, I was like, wow, Brittany, you really are just as evil as your husband. You're just as evil as your husband. It was so, it was just so gross and nasty to me. And I was just like, wow. I was just like, I, and I felt so vindicated because people was like, oh, Brittany's a saint. Britney's an angel. Britney's so nice. And I'm like, no, she's not. No, she is not. She's not angel and she's not nice. She's just like her toxic, narcissistic, weird husband, Jax. That's why they're attracted to each other. That's why they're married. Come on. Come on, girl. And then the whole, you know, Jax and Britney split, breaking up. What are our thoughts on that? Do we think that's real or do we think that was for to get people to tune in to watch the show? Because if we've learned nothing from Scandal, breakups and cheating apparently is what makes the ratings and the views and the clicks and everything. So I'm kind of side eyeing their whole split. It was kind of convenient that all of a sudden they announced their split she's in an Airbnb or he's in an Airbnb and she has four things he needs to work on and Cruz deserves better, blah, 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 right before premiere date. Cameras pick up to pick up the split. I'm tired of cameras picking back up. It was corny when Scandival did it. It was corny when when, um, Beverly Hills did it for Cal Mauricio. It's going to be corny when they do it in the Valley. Picking back up cameras. Stop it. Stop it. Do a TikTok. I'll see it on your TikTok. Picking back cameras. Stop. Stop it. You're corny with it. So Jackson, Brittany, to me, they're both evil. 
And to be back to the racism thing, you know, Faith did say that Britney called her racial slurs, which I 100% believe, you know, I'm not going to talk about anybody's religious beliefs, but I do know that they're the pastor who was supposed to do their whole wedding, he had said some very homophobic, horrific things. I don't know exactly what they were. So I don't want to, I don't want to speak to it because I didn't actually hear what he said. Um, and they had to do damage control. And then they sort of, you know, placated to the gay community and had Lance Bass officiate them. So it's like, no, we're not going to have the homophobic pastor do it. We're going to get this, you know, famous pop star gay guy to do it instead. And it was just like, come on. So to me, they've always been, and Jax, as we know, he got fired because it came out, he was saying, sending like, called somebody, um, this woman's black boyfriend or husband on some other reality show, like a monkey in his nose. And obviously he was black and all this other stuff that all got exposed and all stuff, the, the other stuff that Jax was doing. So they all got exposed for that. So they're all evil and they're all nasty as hell, nasty as hell. So the whole Jackson Britney split, is it real? Is it not? I have no idea. I don't believe anything anymore. Like I'm so, I always believe in conspiracy, but like I'm a little jaded at this point because I'm like, everything is so fake and, 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 and like we know it's fake to a certain degree, of course, you know, like we're all smart human beings, but there used to be this quality where we could suspend belief and sort of believe that this was real and like believe that this was like spontaneous and just unfolding in front of our eyes. You know, when reality TV was a much more happy escape aspiration where now it's just like, how can, who can we tear down the quickest and the fastest? So Jackson, Brittany, they're both just ugh, evil, 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 evil for that. And I have a feeling it's going to work. Because the, fa the fact is, Brittany wanted to take the heat off of Jax because what he did was dead wrong. I don't care who you talk to. What he did inviting Alex was dead wrong. I don't even like Luke, but that's still disrespectful as hell. Like, you know, like, I put myself in a situation, like, say I'm dating a guy and his best friend invites his ex-girlfriend out with all of us. Like it would just, it's just very disrespectful all the way around. Very disrespectful. So instead of Brittany being honest and like, yeah, Jax, what Jax did was wrong. She throws Kristen under the bus. And I bet, and it's going to work because people want to dislike Kristen and have, you know what I mean? It's going to work. I bet you the rest of the season is going to be everybody against Kristen for whatever it is she said that Brittany exposed. And it's going to take the heat off of everything that Jax did. And then did you notice at the birthday party, not the birthday party, it was like the, the baby shower or whatever it was, when Jax pants that guy, did you, did, you, did you check that it was actually Brock's idea, Sheena's Brock, who allegedly is cheating on her with some Australian influencer? Yeah, because we all knew that, was, that wasn't going to last. And <laughs> we all knew... He was, um, you know, the not the PayPal husband, the payroll husband, but word on the street is he's cheating on her with an Australian influencer. But it was actually Brock's idea and Jax did it. See, Brock's is also weird and not like these people are just icky poo, icky poo, icky poo. Anyway, let's move on to an another couple. Let me see here. I have to pull it up because I forget the couple's names. I really, really do. Okay, so we did Jackson, Brittany. We did Kristen and Luke. All right, let's do Danny and Nia. So Danny is like the short guy of the group. He kind of has like Napoleon complex. You know, if you know, you know. <laughs> so he's a short guy of the group. He did, he was on like Nickelodeon. Danny, I hope you're okay. Everything coming out with Nickelodeon these days. Yikes. <laughs> I hope you're okay. But I think he was on like Nickelodeon shows. I don't know what they're called, but he was on some Nickelodeon shows. And then he's married to Nia, who's like gorgeous, tall, beautiful, ex-pageant queen, you know, all of that stuff. And they have like their cute little babies and they're this sort of like power couple. Everybody wants to be like blah, 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 blah. I like 
like them. I like them. I think um, they're cute. Like, you know what I mean? They're cute. They're fun. I like Danny. I like Mia. I don't think there's anything particularly special about this couple that gives like star quality, even though he's an actor and a voice actor. I didn't know who he was. And I guess she's like a pageant person. They seem really cute. They seem pretty normal. They seem genuinely in love. So there's a part of me that's kind of like, why are you tempting fate by going on a reality show with these people? It's kind of like you're punching down a bit, but who knows what's really going on. It seems like Mia is suffering from Again, I'm not a doctor. I don't diagnose, but maybe some type of postpartum. It seems like that's what they're alluding to. She's like, my hormones aren't right. I've been really, you know, um, emotional and she's like crying about stuff. So I don't know if they're alluding to maybe some postpartum stuff. If it is, my heart goes out to her. Hopefully she'll talk about it and get some awareness around, you know, what it looks like and what it feels like. And maybe she, she can talk about that. But they seem okay. Um, I like them. But nothing, nothing like pizzazz, you know what I mean? Like, they're cool. They're cool. I think they work as a normal, fun, staple couple in an ensemble. I'm just not sure if it's this ensemble. To be honest with you, you know what it is. I think this show would work better without Jax and Brittany. That's what it is. And I, and I said this from the beginning. I was like, they could do the show The Valley without Jax. I wouldn't even mind Kristen being on it. I know. I know what she's done. I wouldn't even mind Kristen being on it. But Jax and Brittany, I think, is what makes is what is making it a trash dumpster fire for me. Because he is so clearly producing this show. So, so clearly. And I get it. He's like, it's its comeback show, blah, 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 blah. But like when anybody on the show, even if it's, quote, their show, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, whenever they produce it so transparently, it's no longer fun to watch. Like with Giselle and Potomac, she's so clearly producing. With um, Kyle and, and Beverly Hills, so clearly producing. It's no longer fun to watch when it's so obviously being produced. And that's really what's taking away from it. So I have nothing against Danny and Mia. We'll see what else comes out in the wash with 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 the two of them. Now, let's get into Jesse and Michelle. Jesse and Michelle are the couple that go on reality TV to divorce. You know like we have these couples that come on TV to divorce like we've seen it on the housewives with certain, you know, couples where they know they're going to get divorced or their things aren't in a good place and it's either the woman trying to situate herself in, in a place to get some money or to get a come up or a platform to be to be put in a position to leave her husband, like Mia, for example, in Potomac with Gordon. Um, we've seen that. And I think that that's what's going on with this couple because Michelle does not like her husband. Like she does not like him. She like looks at him with disgust and disdain and he does not like her either. But I think it started with her not liking him. I think he was still wanted to do him, you know, booze it up, have fun, be the forever playboy, but yet have the wife, have the and have the kid and have and have the the social standing that comes with being a husband. You know, not that it should make a difference, but it, but society, it does. There is a difference between a husband and a wife you know, versus the bachelor guy or the single girl. Not that I personally think that there's anything wrong with either one, but in our society, there is a certain cachet that comes with being a married couple. And I think that he wants that cachet without actually the responsibility. And I think Michelle kind of got a wake-up call. I think it was all fun and games when he was paying for everything. And I'm not saying she's a gold digger. That's not what I mean by that. I mean, like, it was just like fun and games, you know, when it was just like they're having sex and they're really cute and he's spending and it's great. But, but, but like she said in the show, have the conversations about like, how do we want to raise our kids? Because we never had those conversations. So you can tell that like the party stopped for her, but the party didn't stop for him. 
And you can tell she's very like disgusted and she's very fed up and she's very done. And so we have that whole storyline. And you know, and the reason why you know that they basically came on the show to get divorced is because episode one, episode two, out the gate, Jesse's like, oh yeah, we're not in a good place. She initiated a separation. What? Like we didn't have to like work for that or figure it out. You're not even lying or pretending. When they just say it like that, it's because that was their agenda in the first place. I think that you, I think they're the couple who comes onto the show to divorce. So we'll see what happens there. Now, I don't know. Put it in the chat. If you know what the whole secret bombshell Kristen said is, put it in the chat box. But I think it's something about Jesse's sexuality. That would be my guess. Because I saw some type of thing where it was like Kristen was trying to apologize to him and he was like, shut the F up to her, like something super disrespectful. And then we see the friend, I believe his name is Zach. At the end, he gets all up in arms and he's like, no, I never said that. I never said that. So at my guess and put if you guys know if you've seen any spoilers, but my guess is she has said something, whether it's a rumor, whether something happened around Jesse's sexuality. That is what I think Br Brittany said to get the heat off of Jax. So she just throws her under the bus because the moment you say, oh, Kristen said something about your husband's sexuality, then all the heat is off of Jax and now everybody is hating Kristen when Kristen probably was just, you know, kikiing and gossiping and, you know, spilling the tea and didn't think it was like, going to come up, but then Brittany used it against her because she's evil. So that's what I really think is going on um, with that situation. Now, to be honest with you, I don't like Jesse or Michelle because that's another thing. What's missing is the likability factor. I don't really like any of the characters. Like, I like Danny. I like Nia. They're okay. But there is not a couple that I'm really rooting for on the show, if that makes sense. And I do think with Jesse and Michelle, Michelle kind of comes across a little, like, I don't know, a little attitude-y. Like, she doesn't seem very friendly. She's kind of cold. She's kind of standoffish. Jesse, to me, is like a guy who, like, peaked in high school but like nobody gave him like he but he like didn't get the memo that like high school is over and like being this like frat bro dude like isn't a good look in your 40s like chill out so I feel like he's still living out his high school glory days and he didn't get the memo that like high school's over so that's kind of what I feel is going on with them which kind of stinks because Episode one, I was pleasantly surprised because I actually was more invested into the couples in the first episode. I was like, okay, you know, they're having kids and they're talking about the next stages of life and they're doing whatever. Like, okay, I could get into this. Let's see what's going to happen. Where it really went left for me was episode two. And it's really about how Jax, to me, it's Jax and Brittany kind of poisoned where I think the show could have went. If that makes sense. I think I think that if the show would have stayed more focused on the lives of the couples, I think it would have been much more interesting. And I think I would have grown to like them. But I think that the show is going to get derailed to be very toxic and to be very cutthroat and very bitter and very dark because of what happens in episode two. And I don't think it's ever going to recover. That is really what I think is going to happen. So I want to know what you guys think. Put it down below. And how long do you give Jesse and Michelle before they divorce? Or maybe they'll just, you know, cheaper to keep her. Who knows? But they're definitely that couple that goes on to the show to get divorced. All right. Now, Jason and Janet. <sighs> oh, Jason and Janet. Janet's the one who's like, I'm aggressive. And Jason, and she's like, and he is passive. <laughs> uh I saw some reports or, you know, articles, whatever, being like, oh, this is like our favorite couple, Jason and Janet. They're so funny. They're so relatable. Um, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just going to keep it 100. Maybe it's just me, but I never think it is 
cute or funny or entertaining when one spouse berates another spouse. Maybe it's misogyny in me, but particularly when it is the woman who does it to the man and this very like, in, but it's guised in this is I'm so snarky and I'm just sarcastic. Oh, he's an idiot. Oh, shut up, honey. I can't. Oh, my, he doesn't do anything right. Like, you know what I mean? Like that. I'm just like that. I don't think that's cute or funny. And that's what she gives. She gives very much like masculine alpha energy. And she just sort of like emasculates and berates him. And I don't think that's entertaining, if that makes sense. I don't think it's cute the other way around either. I don't think it's cute when a guy, like if a guy is disrespectful to the woman in any way, I don't think, that, I don't think that's funny either. But when a woman does it to the man, it's usually much more acceptable. You know, it's like if he was saying to her, if he, if he was like, I'm aggressive and she's passive, everybody would be like, oh my God, this guy's a meathead. He's abusive. How dare you say that? You're so aggressive. I don't like it either way. I don't like any type of putting your putting your person down any way it goes. I don't know. I don't like that whole thing. If it works for them, cool. But it gets very old very, very quickly. And I kind of think that's their whole shtick where she's like the man, she wears the pants and she like puts him down. And then he's kind of just like beta. I don't like it because there's a part of it to me that feels emotionally abusive in a way. But that's just how it feels to me. If he doesn't care, cool. If she doesn't care, cool. But I don't want to really watch that all the time. It kind of grates on the soul. But everyone's like, no, they're so great, blah, 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 blah. Yes, Miss T, she's the pregnant one. Yeah. Yeah, Janet, she's the pregnant one. And it, it, it just kind of screams like insecurity. Like, don't get me wrong. A little bit of banter here and there is great. And I don't think that people have to have, you know, typical societal, this is the man's role. This is the woman's role. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when it is so clearly where one partner sort of humiliates the other partner for their personality. Like his personality is very docile. It's very soft. It is very passive. But I think that's okay. You know, I think that's a strength. It would be nice if more people were softer, you know, but to then kind of weaponize that against him, you know, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I didn't think that they were this breakout couple that's so relatable. I don't want to relate to that. I don't want to relate to berating my man. And I don't want to relate to my man holding in clearly resentment towards me. Because I don't care whether you're in a relationship or not. I don't care if you're male or female or not. If someone continuously digs at you under the guise of sarcasm or a joke or <laughs> it's cool, that breeds resentment. That breeds bitterness. Because nobody wants to be the butt of a joke. Nobody wants to feel disrespected by their partner. Nobody wants to feel emasculated by their partner. They don't. It doesn't feel good. So we'll see what happens with that. I think she needs to just chill a bit. You can still be smart and sassy and and whippy and aggressive and you could still be all of those things but chill on the berating of of him because that's how it feels to me maybe he doesn't care maybe deep down inside he does you know so we'll see so those are the couples now let's move to and i hate to say it again i'm not trying to be a debbie downer with this dumpster fire of a show but I just got to tell you how I feel because that's, that's the only thing I can do. Jasmine is, is the black girl and Zach is the gay guy. And I said it like that for a reason. Jasmine is the black girl and Zach is the gay guy. 
Now, do we think in real life these couples are hanging out with these two? Or do we think that the sh- that the producer said we need some we need some diversity? Who can we get? I don't know. Do we think these couples are real friends? Maybe, maybe not. Or was it, you know, people wanting to be on a reality show who kind of knew each other coming together? I don't know. But it just seems to me like Jasmine and Jack and Zach are sort of like, we have this show about one, two, three, four, five white couples. We got to get a gay guy. We got to get a minority. Is that how you guys feel or am I the only one? Maybe I'm the only one, but it just seemed like it. And I'll tell you another reason why I felt like it. And it was, and it felt very icky to me because, and I don't, and it was what Kristen said, but I'm, I'm not going to blame Kristen for it because I think it's something the producers told her to, to say. I don't think she came up with this herself because it was very like, Now we're describing all of the people on the show. Here we go. And she's like, yeah. And then there's Jack and Jasmine. And like, they just tell it like it is. There's like no BS with them. And it was literally, it felt like she was like, and this is my sassy black friend. And this is my like, my fabulous gay BFF. Like, that's kind of what it felt like. Like, okay, so Jasmine's a sassy black girl who tells it like it is. And Zach is like the fabulous gay guy who holds nothing back. He's going to spill the tea with you guys. It just seemed very like caricature to me. Do you know what I mean? It seemed like very much like we have a show about five white couples. We got to get in the minority. We got to get in the LGBTQIA. I'm sorry if I if I um, mispronounced those letters. I apologize for that. I'm sorry. Um, do you know what I mean? Like that's what it felt like. Go back and watch episode one when Kristen's in her confessional and she's describing everybody. Jasmine and Zach, they're amazing. Like they just tell it like it is. You know, there's just no BS there. And I'm like, oh my God. It literally was like, and this is my sassy black friend. And this is my fabulous gay BFF. I was like, I can't. I can't. And I'm not even I'm not even blaming Kristen for that because she so clearly was reading off of a teleprompter. So producers or whoever it okayed that or and B, I think probably told her that because they're trying to create each persona, each archetype of the characters on the show. And to me, I'm like, well, couldn't you have gotten like a gay couple on the show? Couldn't you have gotten a a black couple or an Asian couple or an Indian couple or Hispanic couple on the show? Couldn't you show that love? But no, it has to be the sassy black girlfriend and like the fabulous gay guy. You know what I mean? Like if you're putting together these couples who I question the the validity of how good of friends these couples are, just like with the housewives, we saw what happened with Anne Marie. Kyle was like, I don't know that chick. I met her once. You know what I'm saying? So we know that they bring in these friends of and these groups of people and these ensembles with Roni. Those girls did not know each other on Roni, please. They did not know each other on Roni, not in any real way. On Real Housewives of New York, right? Couldn't they have gotten a black couple or like a, or any any other race couple if they are going to do that type of pandering because I'm not the person that says we have to have an Indian couple or an Asian or we have to, we have to, we have to. No, it's okay. You can have an all white ensemble. If that is what is authentic and true, that is okay too. We can have an all black. We can have an all Asian. We can have an all gay. That All of those things are fine. We can also have um, inclusive where there are different minorities and different sexualities when it's authentic and when it makes sense. What it boils down to is authenticity and truth. I'm not saying cast all white and exclude people. I'm just saying don't include them if it's not genuine and authentic. You know? So... There's, that's kind of what I'm saying. And it just seems like a hodgepodge. And even with, even look at my little thing. 
Zach and Jasmine weren't even included in the cast photo. This is from BravoTV.com. I had to I had to go and get Zach and Jasmine. <laughs> they weren't even included in the cast. It's my sassy black friend and my fabulous gay friend. Bravo, shut up. So that's kind of how I feel about The Valley. Now, season three airs this week. I'm going to watch, or episode three, I'm sorry. I'm going to watch episode three just because I need to see what happens with the whole Jax, Brittany, Kristen, this whole rumor thing. But I feel like I'm, that's going to be the last one unless it can redeem themselves. You know? So there is that. There is that. All right. So that was the Valley. So as always, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. So what do you guys want to me to cover next? We can do Summer House. We can do Vanderpump Rules. Or we could do The Real Housewives of Potomac. So put it down the chat box. The first person to put what they want us to cover in the chat, that's what we will cover. But yeah, that's what's going on at the Valley. Oh, and you guys, don't forget, we have merch. We have t-shirts. Everything is linked down below in the description box. And it's also pinned up. So I guess we'll do... Oh, Adam says Vanderpump Rules. Okay. Hey, Adam. All right. So we'll do Vanderpump Rules. This is another hot trash dumpster fire. Okay. This is this one might be a little quick because this is crazy. Now, everything going on, I'm just going to go down the line and talk about each character. So, Katie. As we know, Katie hooks up with Max. Max is one of Tom Schwartz's best friends. He was on season eight or nine of Vanderpump Rules when Vanderpump Rules it clearly should just have been canceled around then when they brought in like Max and Charlie and all and Dana, all these weird people, that's when everybody got fired. When Br when Brittany and Jax got fired and Stassi and Kristen got fired, they brought in all these people. And Max was supposedly like one of the managers at Tom Tom. Max also slept with Sheena. So they weren't officially dating. Maybe in Sheena's head they were dating, but they were definitely sleeping together and had all of that stuff. Now, the reason why I think Katie slept with Max is twofold. One, because that was right after she found out that Tom Schwartz and Sheena had kissed in Vegas like seven years ago. And they're like, it was so long ago. Get over it. Eh, no, I'm with Katie on this one. I would be petty forever because how much Katie has been gaslit is insane. Like the entire world was shook. When Tom Sandoval cheated on Ariana, they weren't even married. People were literally cheering when Tom Shorts would cheat on Katie. Literally cheering when Tom Shorts was kissing Raquel in, in Katie's face in Mexico. So Katie has been gaslit for years on years on years on years because Katie does not have a stereotypical, palpable, likable female personality. She's heavy in her masculine. She um, can be abrasive. She's an acquired taste, you know, and I, and there has been a lot of maligning of Katie. You know, I, I personally like Katie. I do. I like her. I, I, I see through a lot of all of the other stuff. I, and I think inside is a very sweet, soft person who's been through a lot of hurt and hasn't had a lot of support from people, you know? And so I think that that really triggered her where she's like, well, wait a minute. I've never really trusted Sheena, but Sheena's always acted like I've been some horrible person to her. You know, Schwartz has been cheating on me for our entire relationship. Side note, if somebody's cheating on you, your entire relationship, at some point it's your fault. And what I mean by that is get out. Nobody is worth your dignity. Nobody is worth your respect. Just like I, just like Brittany and Jax, you know, there isn't any, well, what am I looking for? There isn't any glory in self-sacrifice. 
It's really not. So if you're in a relationship for 12 years with a man who habitually cheats on you, who habitually disrespects you, who throws drinks on you, who chooses his friends over you, who chooses everybody over you, get out. This is a PSA to everybody. Get out. I don't care how much you think you love this person. Choose to love yourself just a little bit more. If all you have is an ounce of more love of yourself, use that to get out of it. Because it's not worth it. These people are now divorced and he is still making her look like a a clown. He didn't have to tell everybody about this stupid kiss he had with Sheena in Vegas. It's still another way of him to say F you, Katie. He didn't have to do that. Nobody knew that they had some random kiss in Vegas. Now the question is, do we think it was just a kiss? I personally don't. I don't think people are in Vegas of age or even under, well, we're not not going there, of age, just getting wasted and kissing. I don't buy it. The same way I never thought Ariana and Tom only kissed. That's not even cheating in your 20s. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Oh, you kiss somebody. Okay. Like, who cares? You know what I'm saying? No. I think this whole we just kissed, I don't buy that. If you just kissed, you wouldn't even bring it up. They all just kiss all the time. You know what I mean? Um, So I feel bad for Katie. I think she was triggered by all of that. So don't forget that Max is Tom Schwartz's best friend, but also Sheena's ex. So when she slept with him after finding out, it was not just an F you to Tom Schwartz. It was also an F you to Sheena. So go, I'm team Katie with that. Go girl, you, you get it in. Now, where I think I lie with Katie when it comes to her allegiance with Ariana, I think she's aligned with her for a couple of reasons. One, something about her, the sandwich shop that to never be. I hope it opens. I hope it gets, everything works out. What I think is really going on, I think that behind the scenes, I think they might be in a legal battle with that woman. What was her name? Penny or something like that? Allegedly, 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 Penny went behind their back and she trademarked something about her. So I don't, I think that Ariana... And Katie maybe created the LLC, but I think that she trademarked it. Something fishy in the in the in it going on. And I think that there might be some type of lawsuit or litigation or talks or something going on behind the scenes uh, with something about her that they're not being honest about because they keep saying, oh, permits, permits. And I'm like, stop it. Like y- you could have been open by now. I also think that Ariana got too big for the britches and was just like, I, I'm booked and I'm busy. I'm going to go be the host for Love Island. I'm on Dancing with the Stars. I'm making all this money. I'm going to go buy a $1.6 million house. Like, I don't need the sandwich shop. You know, I think Ariana's like, I don't need this sandwich shop. I'm in Broadway. I got my boyfriend. Like, I'm going to go decorate my $1.6 million house. I don't need the sandwich shop now. Ariana better be thanking her lucky stars for Scandaval. To be honest with you, if I was Ariana, <laughs> I wouldn't have it in my heart to even pretend to be bitter anymore. If 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 a guy that I was with, we weren't having sex, we weren't happy, we were basically glorified roommates. I'm not, and I'm not saying this to negate what he did because what he did was still wrong. But then if he cheats on me and then all of a sudden the entire world loves me, I get movies on Lifetime, I get to be on Broadway, I get to buy a $1.6 million house, I get to date a really hot new guy, I get to be the host on Love Island USA, I get to write books, I get to be on you know morning shows and TV shows, I wouldn't have the capacity in my heart for any type of anger or or bitterness. I would just be overwhelmed with like joy and gratitude. I would probably be so cool with, with Tom. Is that weird? But like, I feel like I would be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for cheating on me. My life is astronomical and amazing now. And 
thank you. Like, I kind of feel like I would like buy him a beer. You know, I would be like, let me take you out. You know, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like in my heart and in my soul, I would be like, I couldn't have any bitterness toward him because look at all of these blessings I now have. So I'm, I guess that's just me or I don't know how you guys would feel, but like, if I'm Ariana, I'm not really harboring any ill will anymore. If anything, it's like, let me buy you a beer, dude, because you just totally blew up my life in the most beautiful, glorious way ever. Because I don't think anybody is pretending that if Scandaval had not happened, that Ariana would not be where she is today. That is just the truth. That is just the truth, you know? Anyway, back to Katie. So I think that Katie is aligned with her also because of her own issues she's had with Tom Sandoval. It's like she gets a, an, a reason, an outlet that people understand to be so hateful towards him. I mean, I understand it. You know, if there was a guy like Tom Sandoval in my life, number one, he wouldn't be because I wouldn't tolerate that in my life. But she did. I would hate him too. Not like hate, hate. You know what I mean? You know, because of how he treated her. Systematically poisoned everybody against her. You know, so I don't know. This is this is what I say to you, Katie. Figure out what's going on with something about her. If it's not working, cut bait. And then keep doing you. Find your happiness. You know, do what you have to do. And also cut bait from Tom Schwartz. The, there's going to be an upcoming storyline where, and this is where it's like, I can't watch this crap anymore, where Katie and Tom are supposed to be hooking up with the same girl. And she's like, let the best man win. It's like, stop, stop. You know, I, I know that she's like heavily trying to put herself in her mask. She's like, I'm in my masculine. I was a man in a past life. Stop it, Katie, stop. You know, I don't think that, She's miraculous. I don't know. It's giving Morgan Wade, Kyle Richards vibes where it's just like, we let's just create some nonsense for storylines. Because Katie and Tom Short hooking up with the same waitress at Pump or Sir or wherever it is, it's just a bunch of nonsense. A bunch of nonsense. Anyway, Tom Short's his new girlfriend is cute. I think she's like 20 something. She's like a little TikToker. She's cute. I forgot what her name is. They were doing um, their little TikToks and stuff. She's a cutie. She's a cutie. She's cute. I hope she has a good personality, but she's a cute girl. Anyway, that's kind of where I stand with her. So Ariana, we kind of touched on her. Now, new topic for Ariana. So her brother, Jeremy, he's now coming out the cuts. He is estranged from her now. He said it's because they, that Ariana gave his now fiance, I think her name is Rachel or something like that, gave her microaggressions. Basically, he was saying that like Ariana was disrespecting his girlfriend who is now his fiance. And so he had to take a step away from her. And he's like, I miss my sister. I want to talk to her. But like I had to like take a break. And but to me, this is all very performative. I don't know. Again, is this just made up to give Ariana a storyline for the next season? If they get a next season, if she's coming back, maybe she thinks she's too big for the show. I don't know. But it just seems really weird and bizarre that her brother went to the opening of the Jax's sports bar and he was there and he was hugging Sandoval and he's like, I miss my sister. If I ever talk to her, I haven't talked to her in months. And he proposed to his, his girlfriend at Jax's sports bar and like Schwartz was there and, and Tom Sandoval was there. Like, why are you proposing to this woman with these other people? Like, that's a thing I don't get. So I don't know if this is just Ariana needs a new storyline. The brother wants to come back to the show. I don't know what's going on. Maybe they need some new brand deals. They, he wants his 15 minutes of fame. 
I don't know if I believe this. Like, I don't know what to believe because why would the brother all of a sudden be like proposing to her at Jax's sports bra bar? Now I know that he stayed with Tom Sandoval and Ariana for free when he first came to LA to get on his feet and everything, which is fine. But like, when it comes to this situation, my allegiance is to my sister. It's not to her ex. I don't care if you let me stay in the house. You let me stay in the house because you're with my sister. And I'm, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm family. So the fact that he is like, so A, why was he even invited to Jax's opening? I just, I don't know. It, it's giving very contrived. It's giving very creepy and weird. It's giving very toxic. It's reminding me of Meghan Markle's family for some reason, where it's like the siblings want to come out and like get their 15 minutes of fame and like malign someone as much as they can. Because I will tell you this, the family cuts both ways. Sometimes it can cut where it's like someone in the family becomes famous or they get some money and then family members come out the woodwork trying to malign them for their 15 minutes. And it's totally unjust, justified. Then sometimes people get famous, a little bit of money, and the family comes out to malign them. And it's totally true. Either way, I don't think it's justified. Like if your family member gets rich and famous and you don't like that family member, be quiet about it. Unless it's like atrocious, you know what I mean? Unless it's like abuse or something and you're like, no, this person's a bad person who needs to go to jail. That's fine. But if it's just like family beef, that family beef should stay in the family. If it's just like family beef. And that's what it seems like with Jeremy and Ariana. Like that's just a little bit of family beef. That's kitchen, shout out to Wendy Williams. That's kitchen table talk. You know, the talk, like what goes on in your household, sometimes they have to stay in your household. He's been quoted in like People Magazine. He did a whole exclusive with like Us Weekly talking about it. And that's why I'm really side-eyeing Jeremy where I'm like, why are you giving an exclusive to Us Weekly talking about I miss my sister and blah, blah, blah. Well, then pick up the phone. The only reason why the little brothers and the sisters and the aunties and the uncles and the mommies and the papas come out is because they want money. They want their 15 minutes of fame. So I'm not an Ariana fan, but when it comes to this, I'm on her side. If you don't rock with your family, don't rock with them, but you don't go against them in this way for something this petty, you know? And, and as much as Ariana talks about she needs blind loyalty from people, her brother should be the first person because that's actually her blood. Like leave little Sheena Shea alone, you know, let Sheena live you know, but it should be your brother. So who knows what the hell is going on there with her. But I'm, I have Ariana fatigue. I do. I'm happy for her. No shade. Like I want her to get every opportunity she can get, but that still doesn't mean that I'm not fatigued by her. You know, two things can be true. I can be just tired of it without hating on it because I'm not hating on it. I do want her to love her new um, $1.6 million house. I want her to kill it on Love Island. I want all the opportunities that is for her to, for her to shine. I'm just personally fatigued on it, if that makes sense. So there's no shade there. There's no hate. I want her to get all her coins and bags. I'm just a little over, over it, if that makes sense. Now, Tom Sandoval. Ugh. Tom Sandoval is like... At this point, it's just, it's pathetic on a different level. By pathetic, I don't mean the like Scandival thing. I mean, it's it's pathetic. It, no, it, it's sad is what it is. Because like looking at him now, you just really see how insecure and weird and narcissistic and hollow he is. And I, and I don't, I don't, don't mean that in a malicious way. I mean it in a way where it's just, it's kind of just sad looking at him now, you know, he's like trying to hang on, like having like Billy Lee and like all those weird people at the parties. And like, he keeps talking about like, that's my roommate. It's my ex. We weren't together for a long time, but like for like 10 years. Yeah. It's just, it's weird. And like the alleged drug use and like, 
talking about Rachel. It's just the whole thing is just really sad. And even Schwartz is just like, ugh, dude. You know what I mean? Like, it's just sad. Like, I don't even want to harp too much on, on Tom because he just seems really sad. And I, I get what he was messed up. I get he's done a lot of weird things in the past. But there comes a point where it's just like, this person is just sad. So I'm just going to leave him there. Just really weird. Him and his new alleged girlfriend which is, in my opinion, 100% a PR fake relationship. She's the model that's been linked to, like, Leonardo DiCaprio. They just happen to have, you know, Backrid. Backrid is the paparazzi company that people call on themselves. So, you know, when it's like, oh, no, we were just at dinner. How did you find us? Or we were just shopping at Erewhon. How did you find us? We were just getting a Starbucks. How did you find us? Because you called them. You know, Kyle is an Aspen. How did you find us? Because you called us, Kyle. You know, it's because you call them. So 99% of the time, paparazzi photos are staged. They're staged to look like, oh, my God, stars are just like us, caught, blah, blah, blah. They're staged. They're either the, the person called them directly or they're publicisted to set everything up, you know? So it's like, oh, this person spotted in, in, in Utah. Paparazzi don't live in Utah. You flew them out. Sometimes the stars will pay the paparazzi or sometimes um, they will make sure that they get certain types of photos of them that will sell for more money. Stars do this all the time. By stars, I mean influencers, actors, athletes, musicians, reality stars, anybody you see in Us Weekly, Radar, Page Six, Dumas, the blogs, all of that stuff, 99% of the time, the paparazzi were called and it was all staged. A lot of that stuff is staged. That's how a lot of people like debut their relationships. Like, ooh, Blah, Brad Pitt and blah, 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 spotted at the beach. It's like, yeah, spotted at the beach because their publicist called you and paid you to show up and take pictures of them. So then it could be leaked to Us Weekly. Come on, you know? So he's kind of doing that. It's kind of weird and sick. Now, Lisa, has anybody watched, what is it, Vanderpump Villa? I need to watch it. I think it just came out on Hulu today. So I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to watch it. I hope it's good. I love LVP. No notes for her. You can tell that she is. Actually, my only note for her is I agree with what Lala said about the conversation she had with Lala and Sheena about um, Tom Sandoval's mental health. I do understand where LVP was coming from by like, because because Tom Sandoval, he, I don't know, there's something sad and just, you you never know, you never know. And when the whole world is coming at you, that could be really hard. I still think he has his narcissism and all the other stuff. So I'm not giving him a pass for that, but we're all humans and we all have our own flaws and our own illnesses and our own dispositions and our own mistakes. So at the end of the day, I can empathize with any human being. We all have fallen short to greater or lesser degrees. So there's that. But I do agree with that. Lisa Vanderpump should not put the, the, the pressure or the onus on Lala and Sheena to mind Tom Sandoval's mental health. But where I think she was correct is that they all should be mindful of his mental health. So the difference in that is by mind, it's like it's not their responsibility to look after his mental health. It's his responsibility to look after his mental health. It's his responsibility to get help, to take a step back, to do what he needs to do to get well. But it is the people in your life's responsibility to be mindful, conscious of, thoughtful of somebody's mental state. 
So if you know somebody is in a frail state, you should be mindful of that. The way you speak to them, the way you reach out to them, the way you handle them, you should be mindful of the mental state that they are in. But you don't mind it because that to mind is like when someone says mind your own business, that's what mind is, the responsibility of. You're not responsible for somebody's mental health, but you are responsible to be mindful of the way in which you treat someone who is going through a mental health crisis. So I agree with what Lisa Vanderpump said to be mindful of what he's going through. But I also agree with Lala say, saying that then get him professional help. Make sure he's talking to professionals and make sure it's clear that it's not their responsibility. Because, you know, God forbid something did happen to him. Knock on wood, I'm not speaking that. You would never want to feel like, well, it's my fault. I didn't do enough, you know? So it's not their responsibility to mind his mental health, but it is their responsibility to be mindful of his mental state. So that's kind of where I land on that. But I also think with, um, I also thought it was very beautiful for Lisa Vanderpump to be vocal and honest about how she lost her own brother to his, you know, mental illness. He ultimately succumbed to it, unfortunately, whether he meant to do it or whether it was a cry for help that went too far. Either way, it was by his own hand and how gut-wrenching and awful and chilling that is. So I, it, it was good to see her open up and, and you know, share and all of that stuff because when you're so close to something like that, it can change how you approach people. And I don't know, is this an unpopular opinion or is this a popular opinion? Let me know. I'm kind of over crucifying Tom Sandoval for this. I'm, I get he messed up. I get he's a weirdo, but enough is enough with like the hate of it all. Like I'm kind of over that, but I don't know what you guys think. Let me know. Okay. James Kennedy. I like James Kennedy. He's fun, but I could do without him and Allie. <laughs> I think James is really fun, but I think James should just go and be a DJ and go be a TikTok star. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I think James shines because he's really funny and he has really good one-liners. But I, but I mean this for everybody on the show. I think everybody has outgrown the show. Right now, the show, it's very staged. It's very awkward. It's very forced. It's very stale. They're talking about things that happened a year ago that nobody cares about anymore. Um, and... um. They're all just focused on, like Lala said, rebranding and building. And it's just like, okay, but like it's this isn't the show for it. I feel like the show no longer makes sense. The premise of the show no longer makes sense with the lives of the people that we're watching. They've outgrown the show. It's, it, it, it's a wrap for me. I, th I think this should be the last season. Let it go. James, I think, would be great on TikTok. He's funny. He has one-liners. He's into music. He should just go be a DJ, live his best life. When it comes to Allie, I feel so vindicated because I said, to me, Allie is an opportunist. I think the only reason why she's dating James is because she wanted to be on the show to launch her music career. And what is she doing right now? She's on TikTok. Like I said, James should be. He probably is on TikTok. I just don't follow him. Doing her, singing her songs at her little, you know, Taylor Swift world. And she's doing music videos with Sheena and other people. And I'm like, see? <laughs> see? Because it just... And you know what it is? To me, Allie and Raquel, same person. Same energy. Same energy, except for I think that Allie is more sane than Raquel is. Because I do think that there is a true tick, a ticky boom, something off, something like all the lights in the house aren't on, like something's not like the lights are on, but no one's home, whatever the saying is when it comes to Raquel or Rachel rather. But I think that Rachel and Allie are same energy. They both sought out James specifically um, to get with him and to get on the show. 
they both then pretty much admitted it. Raquel said that her dad dropped her off, I think with Allie, it was like her mom or something, to meet him specifically. Anytime, and, and Sheena, I'm talking to you too, Sheena. Anytime a fan purposely seeks you out, that is a relationship you probably should not get into. Have a one-nighter, hit it and quit it. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. But to get into a serious relationship with a fan who purposely has an agenda to seek you out the way Brock did with Sheena when he slid into her DMs, they now lie and say they met at a, a festival, but that's what happens with the truth. You have to remember it. They, I remember they said that he slid into her DMs, but then all of a sudden they met at a festival. That's when people, that's like when people lie who met on Bumble and they're like, no, we met in a coffee shop. Stop lying. You met in Bumble. Who cares? Just tell the truth. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, if I were famous, <laughs> when I'm famous, <laughs> manifested, I would be very weary or anybody out there, famous or not, anybody who is a fan and their agenda is to seek you out, watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Ugh. So that's kind of where I stand with them. Allie, I'm not into um, astrology and crystals and moonbeams and charts and all that stuff. I don't play, I don't mess around with that stuff. So good luck to her with that. But the whole like singing and everything, I think she's doing what she set out to do. I think she wanted to be famous and I think she thought the best way to do it. And, and to be honest, it's what James did to Kristen and to Tom Sandoval. James was a fan of the show. He sought out Kristen and Tom. Maybe he hooked up with both of them. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not saying it happened, but I'm saying I could. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the truth because he sought them both out. And how mad Tom got, you're sleeping with her in my bed with my condoms. Like, I don't know. It was just weird to me. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they were having a little three. I don't know. I don't know. But this, James did the same thing. He admitted it. He's like, yeah, I wanted to be on the show and I sought them out. James did the same exact thing. So maybe it's just, you know, turnabout's fair play and karma's foul play. He sought out um, Tom and Kristen, befriended Tom, slept with Kristen to get on the show. I don't think it's any different than what Rachel did or what Allie did. Getting dropped off at his gigs to meet him. To me, it's scary. It wouldn't be me. I'm rich and famous. You're sliding into my DMs. No, thank you, boo-boo. We got to meet at like a CEO conference or something. I don't know. We got to meet at somebody's dinner. I don't know. But you're, you're, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to me. It's weird. It's weird. Hmm. Okay. Lala. Lala. I think Lala... I, I think she's going to join the Valley next season. That's what I think is going to happen. If the Valley gets a next season, I think that she's going to join that. She just bought like a three point, I think it's 3.1 million dollar home in that, re, in that area. Where she's getting this money from, I don't know. I don't know. Where do you think you get the money to buy a $3.1 million home when she already owns a home in Palm Springs? So this would be her second home that she owns. Is Lala Beauty, give them Lala, send them to Daryl t-shirts doing it? Is it the Bravo check that's doing it? Is it her podcast check that's doing it? Who knows? Did Randall find some of his fraudulent money? Is that doing it? Does she have a rich benefactor? Is that doing it? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not checking anybody's pockets, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But when it comes to Lala, I think she has a lot of valid points for the way that she's been treated versus the way Ariana or some of the other ladies have been treated when they were cheated on, when they have also been the other woman and all of that stuff. But there's some 
there's a little bit of like a bitterness to her where I know now in the show, she's like, I don't want to be bitter. I want to be soft. But like how dismissive she was of Katie because Katie had hooked up with Max. She's like, well, that's like Tom's like best friend. Like you, this is so weird. I got to go like, la la, shut up. Get off the high horse, sweetheart. Get off the high horse. I love that Katie had sex with Max. Let Katie have some fun. Let Katie have some revenge. Because if you, whether or not you like Katie or not, Katie has literally been so dogged out this entire show. You don't have to like her personality, but you have to be honest with how much Katie has been dogged out. Her whole husband cheated on her and nobody cared. Nobody cared. She's been dogged out this entire show. Let Katie have something. Let Katie have one night of fun, one night of revenge when she just found out that her that her ex-husband and Sheena made out, quote, made out. And we all know that's code for had sex. Nobody's just kissing in Vegas. Not this group. Come on now. Let Katie live. And Lala getting an attitude. Oh, there's nobody's honest. Nobody's transparent. This is just so weird. Oh, Katie. That's me- like, shut up, Lala. Please. Last season, you were busting it wide open for some random dude you met in the, the desert on the girls weekend. Talking about I left the whole, you know, mattress wet, something nasty and gross. Who cares? So you're busting it open for random men you meet out, which I'm not judging. You do you. You live your life. Trust me, that is not, that is not a judgment. This is a judgment-free zone. And that's my point. You're busting it open for men. And you have the audacity to judge Katie because she had one night of fun and one night of like a little bit of get back on people who have systematically dogged her the hell out. Shut up, Lala. And I usually really like you and I usually really agree with you. But to me, it's like everybody, nobody can be on a high self-righteous horse at this point. Nobody. Nobody can be on a high self-righteous horse. They really can't. You would think Lala, of all people, would be like, you know what? Good for you, Katie. Good for you for taking back your power a little bit. Tom, at the end of the day, Tom Schwartz doesn't really care. He cares more about the fact, Tom Schwartz cares more that Max betrayed him than he does that Katie did. Let's be honest. And Sheena needs to, Sheena needs to mind her own household, which is crumbling and falling apart. You know, so she needs to worry about that. I don't think she's going to care about anything. You know, shut up, Lala. Let Katie live, like all judgy. And that's the thing. It's like Lala's whole narrative has been, why can't I get any grace? Why can't I get any grace? Nobody gives me grace. But the moment you had the opportunity to show grace, you scoffed and you judged and you acted better than So what you have been begging people for this entire season is the one thing you don't want to give. No, Katie gets all the grace. Katie gets all the grace from me. I know sometimes her personality can be a little prickly. I think that's more a defense mechanism because she's been hurt so much. Katie gets all the grace. Let her live. Let her have some fun. Let her get a little get back. Let her feel a little bit better a little bit. So with me, Lala missed me with that. However, Mazel, congratulations on your baby. As we know, she's now currently pregnant. That's super exciting. And I think that's the way to do it this day and age. It's 2024. If you have the resources and the money and the means and the support to have a child theoretically on your own without a partner, then do it. It's better than what Kristen is doing on the Valley, allegedly just trying to get knocked up by some guy she's in a situationship with just to have a baby. No, because you got to think about that child. Because the person that you choose to have a baby with, whether or not you choose to mess with that person, will fundamentally and definitively and sometimes irrevocably, that's a word, irrevocably, yeah, irrevocable, whatever, (laughs) you know what I mean? Um will have significant consequences on your child's life. And that's what people really need to think about. You know, it's not the idea of having a a child. It's the reality of having a child. 
And it's one thing to say to your child, you know what, baby, I loved you. I wanted a baby so much. I had so much love. You know, this is what mommy did so I could have you versus your dad lives in Utah and we're fighting and we don't see him and he's this and he's that. Maybe he's going to want to come and get visitation rights. Maybe he's not going to want to get visitations, right? Maybe it's, you know what I mean? It's very messy. It's very messy. And as we all know, whether your parent is present in your life or not present in your life affects you as a child, whether it's an absent father, whether it's a present father, whether it's an absent mother, whether it's a present mother, you know, that affects a child and how they watch their parents interact. You know, that's psychology literally 101. I don't think anybody can really dispute that. We all know parents influence their children, you know, if not, then, um, you know, all the therapists in the world would be out of a job, <laughs> you know? So I do congratulate her on that of saying, you know, I'm at a place in my life. I have the money, I have the means, I have the support. And by support, I mean, you know, you have family or friends or a tribe of people to help you raise the child because it doesn't always have to be the father who supports or the mother who supports. It could be, you know, your family that supports or your friends. By support, I just mean a community of people who will be there to help you raise the child. That's what I mean by support. And she's buying a $3.1 million house. I hope she has the coin. You know what I'm saying? So I'm happy for her to do that. And I think that it's great for people, whether you are a woman or a man or gay or straight or whatever the case is, and you want to be a loving healthy parent and you're bringing a child into a safe and stable environment, however you need to do that, I think that's okay. Whether it's surrogacy, whether it's IVF, whether it's adoption, you know, whether it's um, sperm, whether no matter what the case is, as long as you yourself are in a healthy, stable place to bring a child in the world, however you do it, that's cool. I'm fine with that. So congratulations, Lala. Good to you. But girl... Girl, 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 girl. Ooh. Tom Schwartz, I don't really have much to say about him. He just looks like wet fish to me. Like he looks like he smells like mildew. I mean, I'm, it's late. I'm on one. But he just looks like he smells. Am I the only one who gets that from him? I don't know. Tom Schwartz, I'm tired of him. I'm tired of Joe. Like stop trying to make Joe happen. And the fact that they're trying to make Joe happen via Allie, it's giving so desperate. Like, Allie, have a personality. Have a, have an opinion. Pick a side. Have your own mind and brain. I don't like Joe, but I want her to feel like she is welcomed in the group. Well, if you don't like her, why do you want her to be welcome in the group? Oh, did the producers tell you that so you could continue to get time on screen? And why are they trying to make Joe happen? She's, wh what? It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Tom Schwartz, I'm tired of you. Tired. Now, Sheena, 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 Sheena. The only thing I'm going to say to Sheena is, I hope your prenup is ironclad, very smart to get your house only in your name. And Sheena, I need you to tell us the truth about you and Brock. Like, I want Sheena to do a documentary tell-all about the truth about her and her marriage because something isn't right. I, I don't believe that her OCD and anxiety is just about Scandival. I think something has happened with Brock in her house that makes her so anxious with the child, with everything. She literally said she didn't want a nanny because she didn't want the nanny to hear her and Brock fighting. That's scary. You don't want to hire a nanny because of how horrible the fights are with your husband that you don't want them to hear. Also scary is how disrespectful Brock was to her at the at the shop. Because the way somebody treats you in public is usually 10 times better than how they treat you in private. So he was that disrespectful to her publicly. Imagine how he treats her privately. And I don't think Brock has gotten any type of help. I'm not saying he has, but 
any man who has the capability of hitting a woman once, he has the capability of hitting a woman twice. And we already know he did. He got a restraining order. It's on record. This isn't me making anything up. This is on record out of his own mouth. He admitted that he got physical with his baby mama. I'm not saying that people aren't rehabilitated, but someone who hasn't gotten professional help, someone who is still not taking accountability, someone who is still very aggressive verbally, maybe the Sheena shakes like a leaf because she doesn't want to get popped when she gets home. I don't know. I'm not saying he is. I'm not saying he is. I want to make that very clear because I know Brock is always looking for a buck. Don't come over here trying to sue me for defamation. I'm not defaming you. I'm just talking out loud about options. I'm not saying this is happening, okay? But it looks very toxic. And for her to say on camera, I don't want to bring a nanny in because I don't want somebody to see how we fight. What do you think that means? And this came out of her own mouth. I, I, it, it was, I don't know what episode, but it was this season. I, and it might have been the episode when they were fighting at the shop. She said, I want to bring a nanny because I don't want anybody to see how we fight. That's very scary. Very scary. Sheena girl. There's also the rumor that Brock is sliding into the DMs of some Australian influencer. How you got, how you, how, when you lose him, how you got him. He slid into her DMs. I don't know. All I am saying is this. Brock seems like an opportunist from day one. To me, he looked at Sheena as a cash cow and as his ticket to fame. And so far, that's exactly what she's been. His ticket to fame and his cash cow. She, and this is another thing. Did you guys catch how Sandoval had to send Sheena thousands and thousands of dollars? I don't know if they ever said a specific amount, but they said thousands of dollars during the pandemic when she was pregnant and not making any money. Uh, how did they glean over the entire fact that she had a whole ass man, Brock, baby daddy? Were they married then? Were they married before or after they had the kid? I don't remember. Before maybe? I don't know. Either way, either a whole ass fiance, baby daddy, husband, whatever the hell he is, in the home. And he, what was Brock doing? Now, this is the thing. When I say that this is a judgment-free zone, I'm not judging anybody for being on hard times. Whether you are in a marriage or not, you're in a relationship or not, I'm not judging anybody for being on hard times. At some point in life, everybody struggles a little bit, especially during the pandemic. So I'm not judging Sheena and Brock for falling on hard times at all. I don't want that karma coming back to me. No, thank you. I'm not judging that. But I do question what was Brock doing that Sheena was so stressed out because she had no money. He couldn't work. He couldn't find something to do. He couldn't, he couldn't Uber Eats or he couldn't do Uber or DoorDash or I don't know, something, figure it out the way everybody else in the world figures it out when they need some money. I don't know. I, I don't know. And the reason why I question that is because he comes over to the States, you know, DMs her or whatever to be with her. And then all of a sudden she's investing thousands of dollars into his app that was a bust. Nothing happened with the app. That was a big bust. She probably lost that money. Then and he was doing some other stuff. I don't think that other stuff worked out. Then she was saying that he was pitching TV shows. She's like, oh, I think he sold one this week. Well, that would be great. But the only reason why he, he's getting into those doors, which are very hard to get into, is because of Sheena. So he wants to do this sports app with her money. He wants to do these t sell these TV shows with her connections. But yet it's the pandemic 
and she's pregnant with his child, but Tom Sandoval is the one who has to buy them food. I'm really confused how nobody said what was Brock, what, 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 what was Brock doing? You know what I mean? Mm-mm. He's just, it's just creepy. It's giving grifter. It's giving the long con. Brock, and, Brock to me is like Todd Tucker. Brock to me, and then and then all of a sudden Brock's friend, um, O'Sheen, the guy who like grabbed somebody at Sheena's wedding, is now on Southern Hospitality, another Bravo show. So now he's getting his friends cast on other Bravo shows. And the guy O'Sheen on, Bra- on Southern Hospitality, he's a hot mess. He's always drunk. He's always creating weird content for his fans only account. He's also very, very um, misogynistic and disrespectful to women, cussing women out on the show. He was cussing these two girls out so much that the other guys had to step in and say, dude, you need to calm down. Like you need to like really check yourself. There is nothing more disgusting than a man trying to cuss out a woman. It's the most disgusting, weird, pathetic, gross thing ever. You ever see a man trying to cuss out a woman? That is so disgusting. But O'Sheen was wasted trying to cuss, trying to was cussing out these two women, Mia and the other girl, cussing them out. And the other guys were like, "Dude, you need to stop," because that's what an actual alpha man is. An actual alpha male. In reality and in biology, the actual role of an alpha man is not to check women. The role of the alpha male is to check other men, to keep the other men in line. So the actual alpha men of the group, not O'Sheen, because that's not being an alpha man cussing out a woman. That's not alpha. That is women hating that's toxic, that's unhealthy, that's insecure. But the alpha men did their jobs and they checked him and they protected the women. That's what a real alpha man do. They don't hurt women. They don't check women. They don't cuss women out. They protect a woman. That's a real alpha man. A real alpha man is a provider and a protector of women. And he checks and keeps in line other men. That's a true alpha male. So the fact when I realized or found out that O'Sheen, shout out to Natasha. I think she was the one who told me that, that O'Sheen and um, Brock were friends. It all made sense because they're both very, you know how there's BDE? They have LDE. Figure it out, guys, where... It's a lot of huffing and puffing and yelling and cussing women and being really mean to women. Think about how Scandival or how Tom Sandoval treats Katie and treats Lala and treated Stassi. Think about how Brock treats Sheena. Very, very disgusting. Very, very disgusting. That's right, Lucy. Yup. And like Jax too. Very disgusting. So that's kind of where I land on these guys. I'm going to keep watching, honestly, at at this point, just out of like, not curiosity, not even curiosity, but I guess just out of like nostalgia, or I don't know what the word is, obligation, I don't know. But I hope this is the last season. I'm going to try to keep watching. I might check out of it, but that's kind of where I stand. I think the whole, I think the Vanderpump Rules series should be a wrap. Like, this is it, guys. There's nowhere else to go that makes any sense. It just needs to kind of bow out gracefully. It's already outstayed its welcome. You know what I mean? But I'm going to keep watching because I do feel, exactly, Lucy, I feel like obligated. I feel like obligated to watch. (laughs) So I'm going to keep watching. Hopefully it gets better, but... Let's just let this be the swan swan song. All right. So with that, you guys, keep 
stay tuned because I'm going to do um, Real Housewives of Potomac, but be sure to like, subscribe, and share. So with that, <clears throat> I'm going to take a quick drink. I'm going to pop a going to pop a cough drop. So if I'm sucking on a cough drop, I hope it doesn't annoy you. <coughs> but I've been talking for an hour and a half. Okay. All right. Okay, let's do Potomac real quick. Child. Child, 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 child. Even Andy or the producers in his ear, because as we know, Andy doesn't actually prepare for anything, which is really sad. At the reunion was like, this season was hard to watch. It wasn't that interesting. Accountability was the word of the night. It was just a mess. But Potomac has been really, really, really hard to watch. And to be honest with you, I think that they should put the show on a pause and recast the entire cast they could probably keep Karen and that's it they could keep Karen and, and that's pretty much it so let's go down the list Ashley Darby how does she keep a job how does she keep a job a Ashley to me is messy she doesn't really talk about her life. She does it in a way where you think she does, but she really doesn't. Like, what's really going on with her and Michael? She says they're getting a divorce, but then she says she rubs his feet every night. It's like I said before. I called this two years ago when, they, when she first said that they were separating. I said, that is a lie. I don't think for one second Ashley and Michael are separated. I think that Michael did not want to film. I don't think he wanted his life on the show. He didn't want his face on the show. He didn't want anything on the show because it started to affect his business. With all the allegations against him of like inappropriate touching and when Candace was like, oh, you know, you uh, hired this, you know, male escort for sex and everything like that. I think when all of that started to come out, it started to affect his business. Michael Darby has a lot of real estate, a lot of business. He actually has a lot of money. You know, he is actually really, really rich. And I think once it started to affect his bottom line, he didn't want to film anymore. But Ashley did. She wants her 15 minutes. She wants her little Bravo, Bravo coin. And I think they compromised with, let's just say we're separating and buy me a house for me and the kids to film in. You keep our penthouse. And because we're separating, then you don't have to film anymore. And you don't have to be accountable anymore. And then production can't be mad at me because we're not together anymore. And I think that's what they did. I don't think this divorce or separation was ever real. I think they have an open marriage where she can still go out and do her little thing with her little Lukes and this and that, that he can still go out and have his little hotel tryst and hang out with Juan and do what he wants to do. I don't think anybody's cheating. I think they have an open arrangement because how is this woman saying I'm, I'm divorcing him. We're separated. I'm doing me. But then on the, but then she says, I rub his feet every single night. How do you rub his feet every single night? If you live in two separate homes, How? How do you rub his feet every night if you allegedly live in two different houses? Make it make sense. He bought her that house to film in. Point blank period. That was her filming house. You can come here. You can kick it with the girls. You can film because I'm not letting them in the penthouse anymore. That's why when they're on the FaceTime and he and he thought he was on camera, he he uh it ended the call because he's not wanna he doesn't want to be affiliated, he wasn't be on the show anymore because he doesn't want it to affect his bottom line, aka his money. Right? So that to me, that was a big fat lie. Big old lie. They're not separated, they're not getting divorced. You know, come on, call a thing a thing. Also with Ashley, 
I don't understand why no one sees that the entire reason why NECA and Wendy had a falling out was because of Ashley. She was the one who sat with NECA and was like, oh, I saw this article about Wendy being Oshun or whatever, whatever it is that they're like cursed or they're like um, outcast or something. And NECA was like, oh, really? Well, like we're not or whatever it was. And then at Wendy's, or no, then at her housewarming party, Wendy's like, oh, I hope we can be friends. Ashley, we've always liked you. And I've always liked you and just like have my back. Ashley felt really guilty. And then she threw NECA under the bus. And then somehow that turned into Wendy and NECA being two Nigerian women hating each other. What? (laughs) Like, I'm confused. She started that whole thing. But at the end of the day, Ashley started it. But how come Wendy with her four degrees and NECA being a lawyer, how come none of them had two common senses between the two of them? They didn't have two brain cells to rub against each other to say, hey, wait a minute. We actually should not be fighting each other. There's nothing that actually for us to fight about. And I blame out of Wendy and NECA This might be an unpopular opinion, but I blame Wendy the most for continuing the BS. I do. I blame Wendy the most because NECA really was trying to move past it and get over it. And Wendy kept being weird about everything. No, you need to like Wendy, shut up. Like your mom. And this is the thing. I believe NECA. I do think Wendy's mom submitted her name to her shrine and did all that stuff. Just like she said she did. I do. I do. I'm not trying to talk bad about anybody's mother. Don't submit my name to any shrine. If you do, it's going to come back to you a thousandfold because Jesus loves me, okay? So Wendy's family, don't try and come at me with any voodoo, hoodoo stuff. It's going to come back at you a thousandfold because I got God and Jesus, okay? Because I believe NECA, I do. This is the thing. They should have just sat down and talked. And where Wendy really messed up was she did not have a conversation with NECA alone and first. She just took what Wendy said because quiet is kept. I do believe there was a little bit of jealousy on Wendy's side with NECA, that there was another Nigerian, beautiful, educated, married woman coming into the group. I do. I'm not saying it was like a malicious jealousy, I think it was more of like a normal jealousy. Like, wait a minute, there's somebody coming in the group that's just like me? Wait, wait a minute. Like, I I can see having like a normal, almost like jealousy about it. Now, where it gets being taken too far is how they took it too far, right? I do think that Wendy should not have just believed Ashley. Because I do think Wendy took what Ashley said. She went back to her family and her mom made the calls. Her sister made the calls. And I do believe what NECA said about it. Where Wendy with her four degrees messed up was trust but verify. Check check your sources. Cite your sources. If it were me and someone's coming to me with some BS that somebody allegedly said about me, I'm doing one of two things. One, it's either going in one ear and I'm going to store it in the back of my mind, but I'm not going to act on it. I'm just going to keep it there and I'm going to see how people move. Or two, I'm going to go directly to that person, not angry, not disrespect, not accusatory, but just having a conversation of, hey, listen, this is what I was told. I'm not upset. I'm not mad. I just want to understand what exactly happened from your perspective. Because I need to know who's telling me the truth. Right? Because if somebody's carrying you, if a dog is carrying you a bone, it's because they're a dog. You see what I'm saying? So you got to check the carrier. And if Wendy would have just stopped for one second and called NECA and said, hey, listen, Ashley just said you said this. I'm not accusing you of anything, but from but I want to know from your perspective what happened and what was said. Then this whole weird unnecessary 
BS about Nigerian girls fighting like that. And that was also another story narrative that I was just like, stop. This has nothing to do with Nigerian on Nigerian crime. There's nothing to do with black on black crime. This is just a group of messy women who are gossiping about each other and not checking their sources. Can we please leave the whole Nigerian crap at the door? Can we please leave the whole black girl, black girl crap at the door? It's nothing to do with that. This is just a group of women being messy as hell. But when people don't want to take accountability, then they want to add those labels to it. No, they do this crap by Beverly Hills. They do this stuff on Roni. They do this in the OC. They do it in Dallas. They do it in every other franchise. They do it in Atlanta. So stop. It's just a group of messy women being messy. That's all that it is. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. Mm. So that's why I blame Wendy more. Because she should have done her due diligence. Why would you ever trust Ashley? You know what I'm saying? But that's why I believe that there was a little bit of jealousy there. Not necessarily jealousy in a bad way. But as humans, we do have that sort of like, you know, oh, wait a minute. There's a girl just like me coming on. Wait, what? You know, like, it's just that that's just like a human thing. Doesn't mean it's bad. But I think it was there. And I think Ashley hit that insecure nerve in Wendy about NECA. So then when Wendy, so when Ashley said that to Wendy, she grabbed onto it without actually going to NECA and verifying it. That's sort of how I feel about that. So to me, Ashley can go. She's bored. She's boring and bored. She doesn't bring anything really to the show. She's a pot store and she's messy, but we could find somebody else to do that. Wendy, I hate to say it, but four degrees can go too. Because there's, it's like, I like Eddie. I like her cute little kids. I like her family. But Wendy, to me, this season, it's it's too much. It's just, it's too, it's too much. It's, it's just, it's too much. I think, I think she could go. I think Wendy could go. Because, the whole NECA and it just got out of control. It was just too much. To me, Wendy can go. Now, Candace, as we know, Candace quit. And I do think she quit. I don't think she was fired. I think Candace quitting was very, very smart because the women on this show, particularly Ashley and Giselle and Robin, has shown Candace time and time again that there is something in them that wants to destroy her. I think it's rooted in toxic jealousy. Not the little jealousy I was just talking about. I mean, our true jealousy. Because I don't care what anybody says. Candace is a beautiful girl. She's very, very intelligent. She has lacked emotional intelligence a lot. But I do think that she has grown on me because she has worked on herself and she is doing better. And she is taking more accountability because you can be intelligent all day long, which she is. But this little girl got on this show in the beginning and lacked any type of emotional intelligence you could ever have in the world. The way she talked on social media, the way she behaved on the show, she lacked a lot of emotional intelligence. It was a lot of insecurity, a lot of pick me energy, a lot of validate me energy, you know, but I do think that she's gone, she's gone to therapy and she's working on herself and she's getting better and she's grown on me. I think she's grown on a lot of people. She's not everybody's cup of tea, but I do think she's gotten better. And I love to see it. I love to see people evolve and grow as we all should. You know, we all have to work on it. You know, none of us have been as emotionally intelligent as we are today without working on it. So I give her that. But these women have come for so much with her. What they did to Chris was disgusting and wrong. Giselle still barely taking accountability. I didn't say he forced me. You said he made me go into hotel room. And the thing is, just like Karen said, words matter. And it was about the insinuation. It was about the insinuation. Giselle insinuated that Chris did something sexually inappropriate towards her whether that was making her going to a hotel room 
whether it was, oh, we were the only people there, you know, how he made me feel uncomfortable. And the problem, the huge, huge problem with this and Mia and I'm, and I'm trying to give Mia grace because she was brave enough to share what happened, what happened to her. But for her to be like, that's not assault. That's not sexual assault. I wouldn't consider it that. Shut up, Mia. As a survivor, you should be t- way more, way more cognizant to what you're saying. Because this is the problem. I'm going to break it down. Giselle used every single buzzword when it comes to essay. He made me, I felt uncomfortable, all of these things. That whether or not she said he did something to me or forced me, this is the problem with her now trying to backtrack and being like, I didn't insinuate anything. I didn't say anything. Is that when it happens for real in real life, all of the markers of your body, your intuition telling you that something is dangerous or someone, not something, someone is dangerous. When you feel that someone is making you do something, when you have that uncomfortable feeling, which is usually your intuition telling you, watch out for this person, get away, get out, this isn't safe. Then that person might feel if they're like looking to you, I don't know who's looking to Giselle, but in general, that somehow those feelings are invalid. Because now you're trying to backtrack on what you said before was so pervasive, but now you're trying to dismiss it. When all of those are warning signs and markings and buzzwords and dog whistles and ear tags to what that is. Then you make it harder for women who are truly, or men or children, who are really in those situations to say, you know what, this person makes me feel uncomfortable. This person made me do, go in this room or do whatever. It doesn't even have to be, quote, sexual. It can still be invasive. It can still feel wrong. It can still be um, coercive. It's going to make it a thousand times harder for those people to speak out because sometimes somebody saying, this person gives me a bad feeling could be the one thing that's going to save the next person's life or save the next person from being abused, or save the next person from being assaulted. If someone just says, this person gives me a bad feeling, this person makes me feel uncomfortable. But for Giselle to now turn around and act like what she was saying wasn't what she said is disgusting because that is what she insinuated. So on multiple levels, it's wrong. One, you're going to now make people feel like Well, he only made me feel uncomfortable. So maybe I'm overreacting. Well, it's not really assault. Well, it's not really this. Well, you know, you're going to make people gaslight themselves. Well, I'm going to ungaslight everybody. I'm telling you, if you feel in your heart, in your stomach, in your gut, something is wrong or you feel uncomfortable, get out of that situation. I don't care who it is. Don't worry about offending anybody. Don't worry about looking crazy. Don't worry about not knowing. If your gut is telling you something is wrong, it is wrong and get out of the situation any way you have to. I got to go to the bathroom. My, my friend is waiting for me. My mom just called me. Um, I'm feeling really sick right now. I need to go to the hospital. Do whatever you got to do to get out that situation. Listen to your gut and don't let weird, fake, idiotic, disgusting women like Giselle make you feel like your feelings don't matter. And Mia for that fact, which I was shocked when she said that, because I know she's she's on the show said she was a survivor. And when you talk to people like that, or even people who have close calls or something really bad has happened to them, they always say something in me said something was wrong. Something in me told me to leave. Something in me told me not to go. Something in me told me not to stay. They always say that. Something told me something was wrong. I got a bad feeling about this person. So for Giselle to now act like that's not what she was trying to say when that's what she was trying to say is disgusting. And I think Candace a thousand percent did the right thing by leaving the show because Potomac has gotten dangerous on every level. 
It's gotten dangerous on a professional level. I don't know who wants to hire those people. It's gotten dangerous on an, an emotional level. Look what they did to her marriage and look what it did to Chris. He was clearly depressed about the whole situation. It's dangerous on a financial level. Chris said he lost work and everything. And it's also dangerous on a physical level because I don't believe Ashley. You got to watch out. I wouldn't be surprised if Ashley and Deborah was setting Candace up to get jumped. Because why did Ashley bring Deborah there in the first place? And then when you listen to the audio, Deborah clearly comes to Candace and is like, oh, you saying stuff, blah, 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 da, 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 da. And how it escalated so quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if they were setting Candace up to get jumped. Notice how she waited until the cameras were down when they thought they were wrapped. It, it, because this is, a, this is what doesn't make sense. Everyone is saying, oh, Deborah just wanted, Deborah came there because she wanted attention. She wanted attention. If Deborah wanted attention, why didn't she check Candace when the cameras were there? I do think she came there with an agenda, but I don't think the agenda was attention. I think the agenda was to jump Candace. I don't know if the women are smart enough to catch on to that. I don't even know if Candace caught on to that. But to me, I was like, oh, they said they want to jump Candace. Because if she only wanted attention, why did she wait till the cameras were down to approach her? She approached her when she thought they weren't being filmed. She approached her when she thought they weren't being taped. That's why it's only audio because producers were being sneaky as hell. Oh, we're wrapped for the day. If you're wrapped for the day, then how come you still had audio rolling? See, see that you can't trust the producers either. Oh, we're wrapped for the day. Finish up. We're done. If you're done, why, why is the microphone still rolling? See, you gotta, you gotta think about this stuff. You gotta think about this. Deborah clearly thought it, the show's over. If I want attention, I'm checking you in front of the camera. I'm checking you to get my screen time. I'm gonna, we're gonna have our little fight so I can make sure I get, I get my screen time. But if I come to actually mess you up, if I come to actually fight you, I'm going to make sure it's off camera. See, you got to really think about this stuff. She didn't come for attention. She came to jump Candace. Maybe Candace figured it out, and that's why Candace is really leaving the show. I think she should leave the show because it's, it's too dangerous at this point. It's too dangerous. That one girl, Kia, got knocked in the head, either with like a bottle or something, and she had to go get stitches. Come on. What is it going to take? <laughs> you know, what is it really going to take? And this is the thing. Bravo is trash because I am sure there's going to be in, in the reunion some topic about, oh, us as black women, we don't want to be violent. We don't want to show that. Bravo doesn't condone violence. But when the white boys and the only reason why I'm bringing up race is because it actually is pertinent to this conversation. But when the white boys of Southern Charm, Austin and JT, they same exact situation. They but except for on camera. They were at it was the finale party of this season of Southern Charm. Austin and JT were fighting, first arguing back and forth. You know what I'm saying? They were arguing back and forth. Do it not, dude. Blah, 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 blah. Austin got pissed. He pushed Austin in his chest, like bucking up. He pushed him. When he was standing on some like stool thing, he almost fell off the stool. Then they got to tussling. And then JT head butted Austin. This was a full on physical bar fight. These two men had been drinking all day. They were fighting verbally. And then they started fighting physically to the point where JT headbutted Austin. Did we get any type of memo from Bravo that they don't condone violence? 
Did we get any type of conversation from Austin and JT that they don't want to represent white men as violent? And this is not how they want to represent the white people of the world as violent. Did we get any of that? At the reunion, this is how sick it was. Andy was laughing about it with Austin, laughing about it. And he was giving JT a little bit of a hard time when JT was the victim. Austin, who Andy likes, because we know how Andy has his favorites. Andy likes Austin, maybe more, hey, I don't know what's going on behind closed doors. None of my business. But clearly, Andy really likes Austin. Austin was the aggressor physically. We talk about Candace being the aggressor verbally. He was the aggressor physically. He hit JT first. But Andy was giving it more to JT because he likes JT less than he likes Austin. There was no conversation about violence. There was no conversation about white violent culture. There was no conversation about anything. They were kicking and laughing and hollering a hoot in the holler about these two men fighting. But when it's the black girls that are fighting, it's a totally different story. It's ghetto. It's black women are violent. This isn't who we are. This isn't love and hip hop. It's a completely different story when the white, when the black girls are fighting versus then when the white guys are fighting. And at the end of the day, it is simply violence. It's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's not a male thing. It's not a female thing. It's a human thing. Human beings, regardless of race or gender, have the propensity to be violent. The problem is when you treat one group of people differently than another group of people for having the same exact human reaction. That is what the problem is. So if Andy Cohen on any parts of this reunion has the audacity to come at these women for their violence, I'm going to have a problem with that because go watch Southern Charm reunion. No, watch the last episode first. Watch these boys fight and then watch Andy laugh about it. He had a good key key with Austin about it and was going at JT when JT was the victim. JT was defending himself. But because Andy doesn't like JT the way he likes Austin, he was making JT the bad guy when JT was defending himself. That is really what the problem is. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And I'm not saying either group is right because it's not right. Violence in any form is wrong. But it's a human reaction. Because at the end of the day, I don't care how much melon you have in your body or not, we're all human beings. And violence is a human reaction. That's why you have violence in every single group of human beings in the world, because it's a human reaction. And that's why it should be treated equally across all humans, not just pick and choose which humans get to be violent and which humans don't. Andy can go too. Now that I'm thinking about it, Andy needs to go. He does. He has no business hosting reunions. Did you notice at the reunion where he was looking at the card? He goes, oh, this is a good question. In my mind, I've done hosting before. Way back in the day. In my mind, or anything, really, anything you do, how do you not prepare? How is it the first time you're reading these questions for a reunion is on the stage while they're taping the reunion? He does the same thing with Watch What Happens Live. How do you not prepare? I would, I would be, I, I would be all out of sorts. I would be like, give me all the questions. Let me go through my cards. Okay, let me add this. Let me take this out. Blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, you want to be prepared. You want to be in your groove. But you can tell that he's reading these cards for the first time. For the first time. He needs, he needs to stop. And he has all these lawsuits against him. Nini sued him. Leah sued him. All these people. Like, 
not that I necessarily co-signed those lawsuits, because I do think that a lot of it was for self-aggrandizing, you know what I'm saying? Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's for a whole other video. But I do think that Andy needs to be put on pause for a bit because he's all over the place, but he's not doing anything. Do you know what I mean? It's like when you're spread so thin, you're not thick anywhere. You know, I think he should just focus on he can keep his little watch what happens live show. That's a little cute thing. He can keep that. He's doing some show on Peacock about dating. I haven't watched it. So I don't care if he keeps that or not because I don't watch that. But he needs to let the housewives go. He doesn't have any power anymore. He hasn't had any power in a very long time. He doesn't choose who gets fired. He doesn't choose who gets hired. There is the perception that he has that power, but he doesn't. I was watching um, Watch What Happens Live. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it with Claudia Jordan and um, maybe it was Wendy. Maybe it was Wendy and Claudia. And I could tell that Andy had completely forgotten that Claudia used to be on The Real Housewives of Atlanta. I could tell that he truly had completely forgotten that. Completely. It was crazy. But anyway, Andy needs to be put on pause. I think the network will. I don't think they'll do it right now because they don't want to show any type of kink in their armor as long as the lawsuits are pending or whatever it is. It's almost like when somebody messes up at the job and the corporate people keep that person on the job until they see their way clear and then they'll fire that person, but they don't want to fire that person right away because it kind of shows liability. Do you know what I mean? But I think we're going to, I think they're going to phase Andy out. I really do. I think they're going to phase her out. Okay. Okay. So that's Candace. Candace, I wish you well. I think you are doing great with your little acting and singing. Whether or not Candace and Chris make it, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure if Candace and, or yeah, her husband says Chris. Yeah, Chris Bassett. I'm not sure they're going to make it or not. I hope they do. But there seems to be a lot of tension, a lot of reversals of, of resentment. Like when he was booked and busy, she resented him. Then when he, then when she was booked and busy, he resented her. And then with the whole Giselle thing, that probably has a lot of problems in their marriage. She's now putting on hold having a child to focus on her career, where again, it's 2024, you really could do your music and still have a child and do your acting and still have a child. You know, it's almost like a cool thing. Not that I'm trying to make a child an accessory, but y'all know what I mean. So I think like, I don't know. I think the decision not to have a children is because I think they're trying to figure out if they're going to stay together. You know, that's kind of what I think. Adam says, am I going to drop the stream merit link? Yes. Do you want to come up? I'll drop it in a second. I'm going to get through Potomac and then I'll drop it. Okay. So Candace, I wish you well. And I think it's really, really smart for you to get out now because, because Potomac franchise is a burning ship. Burning ship. Mia. Messy, 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 messy Mia. I'm going to tell y'all what I think about this chick. I feel so bad for Gordon. I love G. I don't think Mia ever loved him. I think when she said I married him for the money, I think she was telling the truth. I think the moment she was able to get her own coin through the show and through the platform of the show, and then when he fell on hard times with his family business and everything that happened, I think she was ready to leave. And the reason why I think she doesn't want him to fight his family isn't because she 
doesn't want the fight or she, what, think about what he did, it's because she's done with him because she no longer needs him. And the fact that she is now dating the radio personality guy who she was messing with for years, Mia, you're stupid. I'm not name calling. I actually mean you're stupid. Because what I mean by that is, if this man, this DJ personality, has never truly committed to you, but has had sex with you while you've been single, engaged, and married, but never committed to you, who thinks one of your children is his child, but has never fought to be, to find out, why would you now that you have this platform, now that you're making your own money, now that you're a public figure, and now he sees that he can use you for a come up, why would you go back and choose him? I'm not saying you have to stay with Gordon. If you're not in love with him, let him go. Because Gordon is going through a lot. Gordon is, in my mind, like she said on the show, I think he's depressed. He's clearly depressed. He admitted that he had some health issues. You know, God bless him. He talked about his prostate, which he basically was like, I had some prostate issues when I turned 70. Some things weren't working, a.k.a. he probably couldn't perform sexually. And that's why, and that's when he said to Mia, you know, if you want to find someone who can satisfy you sexually, I'm okay with that because I'm sick. Like, did you guys really understand what happened in their marriage? I think she weaponizes, oh, he wanted threesomes and he wanted this and I didn't want that anymore. I think she weaponizes that as an excuse to make herself the victim, to make it easier to leave him. When the truth is, Mia, in my opinion, you're not in love with him and the well has run dry and you're ready to cut bait because he no longer serves your agenda. I'm not saying you have to be with a man you don't love. But you are stupid as hell to be with a man who used you for sex for over a decade. Never claimed you, never fought for you, never claimed this alleged child. But now all of a sudden wants to claim you and be with you now that you're on a TV show. And you want to play in our face and act like we're stupid, that we're going to fall for some high school sweethearts, star-crossed lover BS. No, he used you for sex for over a decade. And now you're on a TV show and he wants to and he wants to be famous with you, little radio personality person, wants to want some of your fame. Now he wants to claim you because he wants to be on TV with you. We're not stupid, Mia. You are. And I'm not name calling. I mean, I mean stupid because that is a stupid thing to do. It's a stupid thing to put your children through and it's a stupid thing to do to yourself because he's going to use you the way he's been using you and then he's going to do to you what you did to Gordon. The moment the well is dry, the moment you no longer serve him, he's going to leave you and cut bait just like you did to Gordon. The problem is you're messing with these little kids. If it was just you, Mia, knock yourself out. But you got some beautiful kids. And Gordon said that. He goes, why are the kids coming being like, mommy wants to replace you. Mommy's with him. Mommy, mommy's sleeping with this person. You're messing with the kids. That's the problem. I hope you had a conversation with your son, Jeremiah, about his paternity before you had it on national television. Did you talk to your son about how his about how his father is being questioned because I'm pretty sure he believes Gordon is his father and I'm pretty sure it's going to mess with his head that now all of a sudden dad mommy's boyfriend is daddy what did you talk to your child about this before you talked about it on national television well how come you haven't gotten a paternity test because based on the previews, you haven't gotten a paternity test. Why? Number one, Mia, 
and, and not to put the most onus on the mother, but that's the society we live in. As a mother, you don't want to know who your baby's father is. You don't want to know. And secondly, stop pretending like this DJ person actually loves you or your maybe child or not. Because a real man, if he thought his he had a child out there, would fight tooth and nail to A, find out. You could get a court order. If he truly thought that boy was his son, and if he truly wanted to be a father to that child, he could get a court-ordered paternity test to find out if that child was really his or not. Because if he was a real man who really wanted to be with you and really wanted to be a father, he would have got a court order test to find out. But yet there's no, allegedly, there's no paternity test. But allegedly, this is your meant to be man forever. Girl, bye. Girl, bye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You're not going to piss out of my leg and tell me it's raining. Mia, you're not going to paint this man as like your high school love and he wouldn't, and when I'm ready, he would be there. Men don't work like that. Women do. Men don't. And I'm not being sexist. It's, I'm talking about like hard wiring. Obviously, there's different situations for different people. We have, we know nuance, you know, we are, this is the candy cane group. We know, we know nuance. So there's obviously levels and nuance to it. But speaking stereotypically, women might wait and just be there for the man. But stereotypically, if a man wants that woman, he's going to do everything he can to get her. He's not going to wait 20 or two decades, have sex with her whenever he wants to, whether she's single, engaged, or married, or whatever, and just wait until she just so happens to be on a TV show, and then all of a sudden he's going to do everything in his power to be with her. Is he doing everything in his power to be with you? Or is he doing everything in his power to be on TV? Because he sure as hell isn't doing anything in his power to be a father to that boy if he really is the father. So girl, bye. Bye. No, Mia, miss me with all of that. Justice for Gordon and justice for the children. Because I feel really bad for Gordon. I think he was trying to give Mia the world. I think he thought... Because again, stereotypically speaking, you know, a lot of male, you know, self-esteem and bravado and ego comes in being able to sexually please his woman or his wife, right? You know, I'm just talking, you know, like, I'm just talking, you know, pejoratively. We know that there's different levels to everything. And I think, like he said, which was really sad, and if you caught it, you caught it. He's like, when I was 70... I had prostate issues. So I think that he felt less of a provider, less of a protector, less of a man because he wasn't able to perform for her. So maybe he did do some shady business stuff to keep the money coming in. Because like Mia said, she married him for his money. So he probably thought the way I keep her is to buy her and to let her have sex with other men as long as she stays with me. And that was really sad. And that's basically what he said at the, uh, in the finale. I'm still willing to work on this. I told you, you could go do what you wanted. Just don't, it, just, just don't do it in public and don't go with the children. Just stay with me. And it's really, really sad. And I feel really, really bad for Gordon. I really do. He deserved better. Justice for Gordon. Okay. Miss Karen. I love Karen. She's the anchor of the show. She's the best. She's super level-headed. And you can tell with Karen, she is just doing everything she can to keep all the women in check to keep the show going. I think Karen's number one agenda is to keep the show going, not to get the show canceled and not to get kicked off the show. I think that's Karen's number one agenda. And she is just you know, 
Miss Tease, is Gorian is still playing along? Do you see him at the reunion? Yes, that's what I mean. Like, I think that um, it's so sad. Like, Gordon is so broken and so depressed. And I think desperate. And I think he still has the delusional hope that she will come back to him. You know? And I, and I think that's why he's like, you can do what you want. Like, I'm trying to get this money for you. You can have sex with whoever you want. Just like, don't leave me. Like, that's so sad. And like, how disrespectful where you have Gordon, who is still your husband, father of your children, until proven otherwise, sitting here FaceTiming with the guy who is claiming to be the father of his son and who is the man who is now having sex with his wife publicly. How degrading. How degrading. And you see Gordon smiling and just, you know, oh, hey, man. And yeah, okay, dude. And I'm sure he's just going to have Mia's back and he's going to have her back and delusional and all this stuff. My heart goes out to Gordon. I'm a little fearful for him. There's just a deep sadness to him. I'm fearful for him. I'm fearful for him. Prayers up for Gordon. Karen. Karen just wants to keep the show going. I think Karen and Giselle had a powwow. They had a Ponderosa. They had a powwow where they were like, what can we do to keep this show from getting canceled and, and staying on, on, the, on the air? I think they had a ceasefire. I think any of the stuff back and forth between Karen and Giselle in the show I think that they were both in on it. And I think they both got together and said, how can we keep the show on? And I think Karen says, I'm going to babysit Wendy and Candace. And I think Giselle said, I'm going to babysit Robin and Ashley. I think Mia was just in the mix and Neka was just in the mix. You know? So... Yeah. I love Karen. No notes for her. She's great. She's do, doing it and dipping it and doing it. So good for her. I love her. Um, Giselle. Giselle can go. We're just going to float over and pretend like she didn't have a complete fake relationship with the guy Jason from Winter House. Like we're just going to pretend that it never happened. What happened to Jason? What happened to that storyline? He just disappeared. Like, they just disappeared. They just stopped talking about it. There was no resolution. Did they break up? Did they not break up? It would just act like it never happened. I almost forgot it happened. We're just going to pretend that happened. Um, she's another one who uses her children for story. Don't get me wrong. All the kids are cute. Yay. But when your children are your complete storyline, it gets to be too much. And sure, the girls are cute. It's a beat. But I don't need to see the kids every single scene. I don't. Get some get some friends your own age. And talk to friends your own age about your life. And because that's what the show is. And also, I am an adult. And I would rather watch adults talk about their lives than watch children talk about their lives. Because I am not a child. So there's that. You know, um, and also like, I think it's cute for the kids to come, but I want to protect the kids too. Like let the kids be kids. And a lot of times you see on these shows, the children are usually very parenthesized. What I mean by that, I hope I'm saying it correctly, par par parenthesized, not parentheses, but like made to be parents. They usually act very adult. They're usually all very mature. They usually are always giving their mother's advice. Usually that's because these women are very narcissistic. And so they treat their children like their best friends rather than children. So you see this dynamic with Teresa and her children, with Kyle and her children, with Giselle and her children. You see it a lot with certain people and the majority of these women with their children, Ramona and her daughter. You see it where the children 
are usually the ones, Shannon even, are usually the ones counseling the mothers. Do you notice that? I hate, I hate, I hate to see it. I hate to see it. Let the kids be the kids, okay? Let the kids be the kids. Giselle can go. She took basically no, like her not talking to Candace about the colorism to me was a load of crap. And I go, and I have the unpopular opinion. I don't agree with Candace. I don't think that there's colorism on Potomac. I'm not going to get too far in that conversation, but I don't see it. I don't think, I don't think it's colorism. Do I think there's favoritism? Yes. Do I think there's likability issues? Yes. But do I think it's colorism? No. So I actually don't agree with Candace on this. But on the other hand, I think Giselle needs to stop lying and acting like it's the whole colorism death threats crap. That is the reason why she's so mad at Candace. No, you just don't like Candace. And you're mad because your whole take down Chris narrative blew up in your face and everybody saw you for the fake, phony, boring, tired out, dry liar that you are. And you got caught and it blew up in your face because you were looking for a moment in a storyline and you got caught in multiple lies and you don't like it. And you're clearly jealous of Candace. I'm not a Candace defender by any means either. I just call it like I see it. I think Giselle is deeply jealous of Candace. I do. I, I really, really do. I think Giselle is deeply jealous of a lot of women. I think she's deeply jealous of Wendy too. That is why you didn't want to talk to her this season. Don't act like it's because, oh, because of your colorism comments, my children. And girl, shut up, please. You probably have gotten more hate over your ex-husband, baby daddy, Jamal Bryant out here in these streets, dipping it and doing it and having 20 kids on it in the congregation and whatever else he's going to be caught doing. You probably have gotten a lot more stuff over him than you have over Candace's comments. Okay. So I, that's where I fall. I don't agree with Candace on colorism, but I don't agree with, with Giselle that that was such a big deal in her world that she can never talk to Candace again. Like, shut up, Giselle. You just admit, just say, you know what, Candace? I don't like you. Just admit it. You don't like her. But the reason why you don't like her is because in your core, you're jealous of her. Candace is beautiful. She's talented. She has a husband. She has a cute coin. I think a lot of the women are jealous of her. But because Candace has been very pick me, she does have a very pick me energy. She needs a lot of validation. She's very insecure herself. That there's a sort of weird dichotomy of I'm jealous of this person, but I also don't respect this person. So it's like a weird dichotomy there. And the reason why there's no respect there, I think Candace is getting better at it, but because Candace didn't respect herself. You can be as smart as Albert Einstein, but if you don't validate yourself, without the seeking the validation is because a lot of reason why Candace is so hurt all the time is because she wants to be picked and she wants to be chosen. Like, for example, with Robin, Robin's like, well, if you think that I'm such a horrible person who would set your husband up because she did, you know, why do you want to be friends with me? And that's a valid point. Because I wouldn't be boohooing and crying and wishing somebody would forgive me or, or, apologize to me or get my friend back if I tr if I thought that they would set up my husband. Doesn't mean I agree with Robin because I, because I do think that there was I do think that there was some sort of conversation cahoots of who are we going to target this season to take the heat off of ourselves. Was it explicit? We're going to go after Chris and Candace? I think it was. I think it was. But this is a thing because karma always comes back. When 
Candace was friends with Monique way back in the day. She was a part of the Ponderosa powwow when all of the girls got together, Giselle and Robin and everybody else. And they're like, oh, we're going to go after Monique and her husband, Chris, and the paternity of her child and all this stuff. Candace did not go back and tell Monique that, and they were supposed to be good friends. Candace went and told Karen, and Karen was the one who told Monique. So Candace knows this is how this group gets down because she used to be a part of how the group got down. So when she says, I think you guys plotted to take down me and my husband and and make up these lies, I believe her and she knows it's true because she was in the plot, but it wasn't her. It was Monique and Chris. Giselle, girl, bye. Robin, girl, bye. Robin's been fired. Word on the street. She will not be returning. I could have told you that because everyone said, why did Bravo bring Robin back after her and Juan lied? And the whole Patreon and the girl from Canada and all that stuff. And I said, of course they brought her back. Because they don't look at these women as human beings. They look at them as investments. How can I get a return on my investment? That's what they look at these women as. So if you put on your executive producer hat, you're going to bring Robin back because you want your pound of flesh. You want her to come back with Juan, but you want them to come back and spill it. You want them to come back and talk about the cheating and the women and the um, essay allegations and him getting fired and what's really happening and the Canada woman. They want their pound of flesh. By pound of flesh, I mean they want their money. They don't what they're not gonna cut bait on Robin when she's a trending topic and everybody's talking about what happened and are they gonna stay together and has is he cheating? Is it true or not? The problem is the reason why they cut bait this time was because they did not get a return on their investment. I think that they were very clear with Robin. You come back, you need to be transparent. And she was not. She didn't, she stayed and she lied through her teeth. Juan lied through his teeth. They deflected. We don't care. It's all good. So she came back and she continued to lie. And that's why she got fired this time. But it was very clear that the producers told them, you need to get Robin to tell the truth. That's why you had Giselle, her green-eyed bandit best friend, first time ever in life, actually question Robin. That's why they had their little intervention with Sharice and Ashley, because the executives wanted a return on their investment because they don't look at these women as people. They look at them as investments. So they will use you as long as they get a return on you. But when you stop producing, they will cut bait. And the fact that Juan did not show up at the reunion, that right there, you knew she got the pink slip. I mean, Juan should have showed up at the reunion if you if if they wanted to keep this little Bravo cute coin coming in. He should have showed up at the reunion. And Robin, if she is incapable of an emotion, she should have at least pretend it. But this whole, I don't care. He didn't do it. Why are you coming after me? Blah, 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 blah. This attitude, this staunchness, this, you know pretending like the world is against them and they're innocent, that narrative and BS isn't going to fly. And she tested it and she, she, she effed around and found out. And that's why she's fired. But of course they're going to bring her back because they wanted a return on that investment. They didn't get the return. She got fired, which is good. Okay, NECA. Ugh. NECA, 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 NECA. She's a no for me. And to be honest with you, I actually like her. I know it might be an unpopular opinion, but I like her. I think she's really pretty. Uh, I like her 
I, I like her style. I think she has good like clothes style. I think she's fun. She would do like a good like boozy brunch, a good dinner, shopping, home decor. I actually really like her. I think she's like a really like a fun girl. The problem is it's almost an Anna Marie problem from Beverly Hills. When you come into the group and you let somebody else set your agenda, you let somebody else wind you up. And that somebody else was Ashley. And then you spend your entire season not connecting to the audience, not connecting to the other women, but fighting a battle that was never yours. NECA and Wendy should have never been fighting. That was not a that was not their fight. It was a fight that they chose for whatever stupid reason. If NECA would have for one second said, you know what? Ashley was the one who came to me with this BS. Let me just chill out. Because if I was NECA and Ashley came to me with that and it was like a normal conversation and then Wendy went crazy and went to her family and they're doing voodoo and shrines and all this other crap. To be honest with you, if I was NECA, I would not have brought it to the show. I would have, shout out to Wendy Williams, that would have been kitchen table talk. I would have not brought it to the show. Not that I'm hiding anything, but I would have done what they do where it's like, I know something that you did, but like, I'm not going to say it, but like, I know what you did, but, but I'm, it's just, it's too much, but I know what you, you know, like something like that, or just like, just not mess with her or anything, but I would have just sort of owned my own narrative and my own story. And I would not have come in hot and I wouldn't have brought the specific of her mother brought my name to this. I would have just said she her, did something, whatever. It's a family issue. I'm going to leave it there. And then I would have kept it pushing and I would have been cute and done, done my thing, made friends with people, kept Wendy at arm's length, kept Ashley at arm's length. But I would have owned my own story. Where now NECA's story is very muddled with going against a Nigerian and blah, 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 blah. And all that other bull crap that really doesn't even matter because it had nothing to do with them being Nigerian. It had nothing to do with them being black. It was just a bunch of messy women gossiping. And so it got all muddled and everything. Now, her and her husband. I don't... <sighs> They seem really sweet and cute, but it seems like they were long distance and then got married. Because isn't he like a traveling doctor or something? And they hadn't like really lived together. And then she had her like wedding gifts from like years ago that she had like never opened. I don't know. It just seemed like they were like long distance and they got married, but then they were still kind of long distance with traveling. I don't know. It was kind of weird. Um She's sharing her like pregnancy journey, I, IVF or IVI and things like that. So hopefully that'll work, you know, prayers up, she'll get pregnant and everything. So that's really cute. But I feel like she got muddled in this whole thing because she didn't know how to play the game. I don't think NECA's mean. I think she seems actually like a really sweet person. I think she got, which is different than how I feel about Anna Marie. Where I think Anna Marie and NECA are the same is that they were thrown into the situation new and they became the mouthpieces of people and they were fighting somebody else's battle that they never should have been fighting. Where I think they're different is I don't connect with Anna Marie's personality. I think she's weird. There's a tick, something's off. With NECA, I actually think she's really cool. I think she's funny. I think she's pretty. I think she's sweet, down to earth. Seems like a really normal, nice person who got caught up in something. That's kind of where I land with that. But I don't think she gave enough for me to care whether she comes back or not because she put too much energy in the fight with Wendy versus establishing her own personality onto the show. That's just kind of where I... Um, land on that one. So overall, I, 
I think Rohop could do a reboot pause. I think everybody could be fired except for Karen. And I don't need Sharice on my screen ever again. I don't know what they're doing with that one. No to Sharice. And I think maybe we could do a pause and a reboot because the last solid three seasons of Rohop have been downhill, downhill, downhill. Harder and harder and harder to watch. You know? So, yeah, it's just, it's not good. Chelsea says, at the end of the day, they both flopped. Yeah, I agree. I think NECA and Anna Marie both flopped. They flopped for the same foundational reason. They did not establish their own personality outside of a fight that was never theirs. But I do connect with NECA more than I connect with Anne Marie. But not enough to care if she comes back or not. You know? So, yeah, I, I think they should do a pause and a reboot, keep Karen as the anchor, and recast everybody else. So, you guys, with that, I'm going to drop the link in case anybody wants to come up and chat. And as always, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Woof. All right, you guys. Let's see. All right, let's do some of your Kanekin questions and comments. Dun, 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 dun. All right, Michelle says, I'm not watching because these Cretans set up faith out of racial hatred, racial hatred, and I see right through them. No racist should be allowed a second chance, so I never support anything they did after that. I agree, I agree. Hey, Deb, this is the Valley. Hi, Candy. Hey, sweetheart. Debs is watching below deck. Hello, Adam. Hi, Candy. What is up, sweetheart? You want to sound off? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, with the Valley, I haven't watched mm -hmm. it yet. I, I, I might watch it. it. I don't know. The dynamics just seem off. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed on YouTube. Um, I think you pointed out um, on your last live how now the after show they merged them together or something now mm. with Vanderpump, which mm -hmm. I don't like. I don't think. I mean, I, I just think uh, even though it sounded a bit blunt, I, I, I agree with what you were saying about you know the forcefulness of this person that comes across as a bit camp this gay bff of britney and on the side you know they're not even in the court cast photo mm -hmm. like and to me that's just kind of a weird like you know you're trying to make them sound like there's some main cast yet you're giving them some d-list service by just giving them some profile pictures and that's it <laughs> exactly they're the tokens with um with Vanderpump rules, I think the season, I think they will get an, another season, but I don't think it, you know, it's ever going to give us what we liked about the show, why we wanted to watch the show from the get go. Mm -hmm. I think they will get another season just because they're, it's doing good, it's got good results somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> view, and I mean, to me, like I know we we spoke about this earlier with La La getting the house, but I'm not too surprised that she's got all this money. I just find it shocking how the others don't have. I mean, Sheena's house is like worth eight hundred thousand dollars less than La La's, and. I don't know, and you have um, it's a it's a nice house, and, and Lala's house is um, so called near the valley or borderline in the San Fernando Valley area, but but mm -hmm. the neighborhood is like adjacent to um, like only a ten minute drive to um, Beverly Hills, is what she said on on her podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, 
wow I feel like you know it's not obviously it's not quite Beverly Hills but if you're just 10 minutes away then at least that's something mm-hmm. um I'm not going to be able to watch Vanderpump Villa unfortunately until either next week or the following week because um it's on Hulu your way but our way it's on um Disney plus and oh yeah uh, because we don't have Hulu in the, in the UK and on because of some American licensing thing, it it's getting a bit delayed. I don't know why. Oh no! But I am. Um, I trust you to give me your word. Yes. <laughs> on how on how it is. I mean. Yes. I think I like it, but it's kind of a. I want to see the the difference of the dynamics. You know, people. Lisa's assured it's not being it's no copycat of you know it's not going to be we're not going to have um the same style it's going to be more uh elegant but there will be some riffs <laughs> but yeah. uh did you did you watch um uh what's it um Mauricio's by Beverly Hills I did I can't stand Sophia <laughs> I, I, can't I, find, I can't stand Sophia. I can't stand any of them because I didn't realize, hey Chelsea, I didn't realize hey, just how, yeah. how just how entitled and bratty these people are. Mauricio included. Like it's ridiculous. I actually really like that Michelle woman who was like, you know, this is crazy. I want to see it at the table. Yeah, no nepotism. Screw that. <laughs> yeah. I like, like maybe um, just for the show, but not in real life. Yeah, I, I like. Um, I have no problem with the middle daughter, but the oldest one, Alexia? kind of. Yeah, but the oldest one kind of pretends that she's this honcho, like, oh, I, you know, I'm this founder, and you know, I founded the agency, you know, I'm this, and she's always kind of like I, you of her because. Um, Wait, you mean fair? My friends. Yeah, yeah. One of my uni friends mentioned um, she was briefly featured on that um, Rich Kids of Beverly Hills because she's like best friends with that um, Dorothy Wang woman. Mm. And, and but Sophia, I can't stand. It's just kind of like in any other person, you would have been fired from your job. And I, I can't. I like. Um, <laughs> I kind of like the wit of um, Zach and Ben, but then they have their riffs. I'm on episode five currently. Okay. And I like kind of that sarcasm wit because that just reminds me of, you know, the British kind of humour, you know, kind of dry like that. Mm-hmm. And, no, uh, and the random guy is having a moment. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Ben's side. Like, I'm not there. <laughs> on my Instagram just to look at people's selfies and that's it. <laughs> no, it, cause it wasn't about that. It was, I'm on, um, Brandon's side with that because it's a statement to unfollow the person. Like it's, it's, it was disrespectful and he knew it was disrespectful. He just said, Oh, I did watch people's selfies. Like, come on. It, it sends a message. It's rude. He was he was dead wrong, and he was also a hypocrite because how are you saying, oh Brandon, you're petty because you're upset that you're that a higher up at your company unfollowed you, but yet he's following everybody else on Instagram when then he had a full blown temper tantrum like a child when his friend Zach made a very normal funny joke during a roast. It wasn't like, that who's criminal. Really, it was who's diverse. really being petty? Like, who's really being petty there? Ben was being petty as hell. He needs to grow up. And he knew he was wrong. That's why at the end he was like, yeah, you know, like, I'm sorry and, like, whatever. Oh, wait, Chelsea, come back. Well, ha- where did Chelsea go? I don't know. I'll drop the link again. But, but I, we'll I think let you talk. Thing, sorry, I mean... Chelsea, come back. <laughs> with the Zach thing I kind of um, like to to me that was just kind of pure wit you know I don't think what Zach said you know maybe a little bit 
you know, maybe Ben requested not to say that, but he it wasn't super criminal. You know, that was kind of just, it could have been a lot worse. He could have said, but the girlfriend was trash. He didn't say that. He just said... Exactly. <laughs> and he had like a full-blown... Um adult tip not adult child tipper tantrum but he's talking yeah i mean he's saying brandon's being you see what i'm saying i i see what you're saying with, 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 i think you know for me the the brandon thing was just kind of like he i don't know kind of what it is but just the way kind of he he's he spoke kind of just kind of came across diva i think you know for a business profession it was unprofessional for Ben to unfollow him because, you know, as they're doing a reality show on Netflix, yeah. the whole, um, you know, people are invested and want, oh, like, causes drama. I think the Brandon guy is a bit of a diva type of person and kind of seems like someone is just like that. But I, I get what you're saying with the Zach and Ben thing. You know, I, I think, you know, to me, I take I don't take things like too seriously like unless you're like going to go for a proper like you know try and stab me in the back multiple times like you know it, and also was it wasn't like he said it was like his fifth dig or fifth joke he only and and to to me also um what is your take on um the idea of them talking about Max but not showing him on the show on Vanderpump. I mean, they gave him a little flashback. Um, I think at I... this... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Sorry. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. Um, I think it's hypocritical of them because if you're going to show Jax, you might as well show Max because they got fired for the same reason, for being racist. Like, mm -hmm. Max got fired in the same dude because they had tweets that came out of them saying the N-word and everything. So it's like, if you're going to... And I don't think they should have given Jax a second chance. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, if you're going to already, you know, go back on your integrity and give Jax a second chance, you might as well show Max because they both, both they both got fired for being racist. So why are you not showing Max? But maybe Max didn't want to come back. I don't know. Maybe... I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they should have given, even though I, I'm watching the Valley to see what's going to happen. And we talked about it. I'm, I, I'm allowed to be duplicitous. You know, I do think it's wrong for them to have given Jax and Kristen a platform just because Scandival, you know, upticked the Vanderpump rules brand. Exactly. A after all of that stuff, after what they did, it's not like they should be absolved for that. So, mm. hey, Chelsea. Hi, guys. Sorry, I'm in the middle of ordering food, so I've just been in the background oh. listening. <laughs> it's okay. You want to sound off? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't watch it, the Vanderpump Rules. I haven't been watching it. Um, okay. Or I don't, know if, I don't know if that's what you're recapping or if you were going over the Valley. Um, yeah. You can have, do Vanderpump or Real Hop or Valley. Okay. So I'm definitely want to talk about Real Hop. I'm just, okay. I'm so over all of them. I agree with everything you said. Like I was listening. I agree with everything you said. I think that Ashley, she just gives me so much of Whitney vibes from Salt Lake City. Like just no yes. storyline herself, but just really yes. messy and just like really victim. Like when you come for, like not come for her, but like when you call her out on stuff, she's like, well, what? And she just, she's a meddler and Whitney is a meddler too. Um, Mia be lying. So I just, I think that Mia definitely tells some truths, but I think there are some lies in there as well, which I, yep. that's what I was saying. Like it kind of gives me like a little bit of like Monica vibes in a way. Like I feel, and the kind of like, I don't, we don't know exactly the kind of, well, actually we do know the shady stuff Monica did because she was sleeping with her brother-in-law. But I mean, it's just as shady, the things that like Mia was doing too with her side piece, you know, bringing the children around and uh, Jeremiah busting, busting her out in front of the dad. Like, I'm just so about like family and I'm, I worry about like kids and their traumas. And I just feel like this is going to be very traumatizing for them. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when they get older and I just, I just feel bad. Like that's all that my heart goes out to because at the end of the day, like, I don't know how I would feel if my, if I found out like my mother married, got with my father, like just for money, like, you know, how you're made out of love. And like, I wasn't really made out of love. Like you were just trying to, you know, get mm -hmm. your life on track and stuff. So that part and then Giselle, I cannot stand Giselle. I mean, I really can't stand Giselle as much as I can't stand Candace. That's really what it is. Like I was saying in the chat that like, I don't agree with, I don't agree with violence at all. And I don't agree that um, you should put your words, not your words, but your hands on someone through words. Mm -hmm. But I also mm -hmm. think it's important to understand that like, there are people out here that are, are, are unhinged. You know what I mean? So if you are going to talk the talk, just know that some people might talk back with a fist or two, you know what I mean? And you just need to prepare yourself. So like if I had a friend that got in a physical altercation through my mouth and she ended up bleeding and like being jumped on, mm -hmm. that's just not a friend. And I know she came in through Wendy, but I felt like, you know, her and Wendy and Candace, like they were all together. So I just, I felt really bad for Kay for that. And um, also Giselle, I think that last season, I think I heard someone point out how she had mentioned, was it last season, the season before with Sesame Street, with Deborah and Giselle had- Last season. Season before, when Giselle had claimed that Chris grabbed Deborah's butt, her booty. Yep. And that is also like SA, you know what I mean? So yep. my thing is she did not, Giselle did not say like I was essayed or, you know, but she definitely implied it. And that's what Giselle does. Yep. She tries to move like chess, but she's not. She's moving like checkers and we're calling her out. She uses other people's lives and their problems for their storyline. So I'm actually, I'm actually here for a break on ROP. Me too. I think it will like let Karen simmer down on the DUI she got. Mm. That way Giselle can't use it as fast. You know what I mean? Like she's she I just see her using that and I just I'm just over it. And I I think Adam you mentioned it that like some producers in Bravo like they just give this these high chair the favoritism yes, to Giselle, the, I, I, Kyle, I Teresa. The, yeah. And it's, it's just like it's so like annoying. they can't they can't troll us. Like the thing is they feel like they control us the whole time. Feel like oh the fans won't be able to see that, but like, it's like you know, uh, as as long as 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 long as Andy's the host of the reunions and his stupid chat show, you you can see it instantly. I mean, he at the reunion Not chat as, show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, at, at the reunions, he doesn't even ask tough questions. Oh and generally, God, all his questions are just so bland like you just ask what the fans and some of the ones that they pick out are just questions that kind of like anyone could have given that answer that you know it's not it, I mean to me I I just think with um with this show firstly I think the way that they've done the dynamic is just too much in the first place I think seven is kind of the magic number I think eight kind of and I know people are kind of saying that Necker kind of is like Crystal Minkoff in the way that even though she's a housewife, it's kind of like this friend of style. But I actually quite liked her, but I kind of feel like I didn't see enough of her. And I kind of agree with what Candy was saying earlier, where some people, you know, kind of want to be a, a ride along instead of their own person. And... I kind of think if she was more of her own person, instead of Ashley's kind of ride along, then she I think she been... did herself a disservice. Yeah. Like I don't know what happened between her. I mean, Anne Marie and Neka definitely did themselves disservice by just going after whatever Kyle said and whatever Ashley said. Like Ashley is the producer's plant. She's gonna just like she planned the thing with Deborah. She planned. She she literally did it the first episode. Like with the whole ocean, I don't want to mispronounce it, but you know, was she tried saying what NECA said about her and then she had to back down on it and like recorrect it, but then try to get mad when Wendy or NECA, whoever called her out. And it was like, we see what you're doing, Ashley. Like, just just get gone. I think in, in the um, second or third part reunion, 
she, part she's gonna say how she rubs Michael's feet every night. Like, girl, get off the show if you're not gonna like be honest about it. And the part that really, really irked me last night, or um, when Robin, I felt like she was trying to be transparent in her being with Juan for 28 plus years, however it was. And she was like, things are going to happen in marriage. Like, you know, you know, we're going to tough it out. And it's like, that's all the audience is like really asking from you, but like be transparent about it. I just feel like, I don't know if Robin is truly like in a denial sense. Like, I feel like how Karen said, Robin is smart. Like she's very like, I'm intelligent. Stop playing us for a fool. Like you have to know, like when Karen clocked her, she's like, um, no, no, Karen, no, Robin, that would be Juan you know, about he doesn't mm-hmm. know how many people he slept with. It's like, you you can't tell me that you don't see this. You know what I mean? So, like, if you just want to play Boo Boo the Fool, like, just fine. But just get off the screen then because that's not what it's play. supposed to be. It's supposed to be transparently, like, showing your life. And some housewives don't want to do that. And some of them are getting away with it because they're favorites, i.e. Giselle. Exactly. Hey, Raji. Hey, Cephas. I hope I said it correctly. Man, I just wanted to like say something really quick. Like, I don't know if you guys discussed this, but like, remember when Candace pulled out those like big screen shots, like on (laughs) the fucking like post. Oh, I'm sorry to mean to curse on the (laughs) on the poster board. Mm -hmm. And I totally feel like Giselle like didn't know about Robin like DMing or like messaging the bloggers because like when Candace first brought it out, if you look at Giselle's face, she's kind of like shocked for like a second, and then she like pulls it back together, and then yep. her and Robin like later lie together, you know, because like the Green Eye Bandits are you know always in sync, so they lie together and said that like oh Giselle knew, but I, she actually didn't know, and so. Even if it was for a second, I'm kind of glad that I saw somewhat of a crack, you know, like between 100%. those two. Hundred percent, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, and also, um, I hate Giselle. I hate Robin. They suck. I just want to rant for like a second. I hate, um, <laughs> like it, it's it's hard for me to like totally hate Ashley, even though I know she's like awful. It's like t- hard for me to totally hate her because there's just something about her that I find kind of like entertaining but she also does horrible shit and like she's super she's obviously incredibly jealous of Candace and Candace is my girl I love Candace like she's my favorite housewife like of all time and I find it annoying even though I like I like Wendy too but I find it annoying how Wendy feels the need to like jump in and kind of like say like well Candace like this is like this is wrong and this is how you should have said it and you shouldn't have used those terms and I just feel like maybe I'm just biased but like I just feel like Candace has every right to react the way she does to like what Giselle and Robin and Ashley do to her because they're just constantly like attacking her and she's been under attack. And I just feel like because she just fights better and has a better mouth and overall just has like a better life, like they just can't handle it, especially, you know, I think the show is like riddled with colorism. So like, especially Candace being a dark skinned woman, I just don't think the mixed woman or the light skinned woman can really handle the fact that like in so many ways she's like better than they are. So yeah, <laughs> sorry. I just had to like get that all out. Cause I was like, I was so it's pissed okay. yesterday. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. All good valid points. Hey, CFS, <laughs> you want to share? Hey Candy, how are you doing? Good. How are you sweetheart? Not bad. I haven't called in in a minute. I know. I know. Sound off. Absolutely. Um, I think regarding Potomac, Okay. Um, knowing up front that both Candace and Robin left the show after the reunion, um, it loses a sense of sting watching the show because, you know, Andy started off the reunion by saying they wanted to conceive like reconciliation and move forward. And knowing that, especially Candace left, um, it kind of like loses its impact. And I'm, I'm kind of sad that she left. I'm, you know, I'm glad that she left on her own terms, like she wasn't fired like Robin was. But to that end, it would have been, mm-hmm. you know, even more of like a middle finger if she were to have like toughed it out and, um, you know, really showed the Green Eye Bandits that you're not going to like bully me off the show. Um, something that she did that was kind of weird, though, during the reunion was with the poster boards and, you know, Raji. I hope I'm saying your name right, Raji. Um, you mentioned the right. boards. And I thought that 
it was a total miss. I, it's funny because, like, since season five and Monique and her her binder, a lot of other franchises have been trying to, like, have their binder moments since then, whether it be through, like, you know, uh, like, poster boards or PowerPoint, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, I think it, it didn't land because, A, it was blurred out, and B, certain names were censored. I don't know what she was trying to do in that moment, but it just didn't land the way it did. Um, yes, yeah, so that's all I have for now. That's really good. Thank you. And You're I, very welcome. yeah, I agree. With with Candace, it's like the only reason why I'm happy she left is because I think it was getting too dangerous. Like if it hadn't been for like Deborah coming and trying to like fight her and everything, I agree with being like. I'm not going to let these women like knock me off my perch. But there comes a point where it's like Candace is beautiful. She's intelligent. She's very talented. Where does staying on the show become a detriment to everything else she has going on? Absolutely. Almost like a Candy Burris. Not the physical threat. But I feel like Candy has so much else going on with Roa. And Roa has gone downhill so much. And then everybody's gunning for her because she's actually the one who's like booked and busy and has the money where I think that's another reason why Candace left Roa very similar to Candace where it's like, I actually have stuff going on and these women are coming at me because they have nothing going on. So what is that threshold between you're not going to knock me off my position to if I stay here, you're going to poison and sabotage my position. And I'm glad that you mentioned um, return on investments earlier mm -hmm. because I think that there's a higher return with keeping Candace, Wendy, NECA, um, even what's her face, uh, Mia, mm -hmm. you know, whereas like with Giselle, I think the issue is that number one, you're not transparent. Number two, you don't want to work with half the cast. You're not, you know, advancing storyline. You're not giving it the, uh, anything else. And so if I'm a producer and I'm trying to put together this project, you know, this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. and, you know, you're not getting a good return on your investment. So it's like, I don't understand why season after season, they continue to keep Giselle. And at, after a certain point, and she's gotten away with it so far, but with the, with the wordsmithing of it all, and she's not, saying certain words she's not you know outright alleging that chris did something to her but she's gonna get really slick and very comfortable after a while where she's gonna you know escalate even further as she stays on longer on the show so i i almost think that they should like cut ties with her and you know put their eggs more into like the future of what Potomac could be, and it could be something aspirational, but at the moment, there's something very frustrating and, you know, kind of sad watching the show. Oh, a hundred percent. But I also think with Giselle, the way they put Robin on notice last season, and now she's fired because she didn't, you know, put up. I think, I think they put Giselle on notice. That's why she got knocked from her spot. Giselle has always sat next to Andy. But this reunion, she got knocked to sit second seat to Karen. I think that is a clear message to Giselle. You need to step up or you will be fired too. Because I agree. Yeah, I agree. What is she bringing I, to I the agree. show? She doesn't yeah. really bring anything personal. She's kind of flat and dry. She's mean as hell. She's using colorism as an excuse not to talk to Candace, which is ridiculous. She's not, she wasn't really holding Robin accountable. She was giving a lot of lip service because I do think pr the producers put her on notice that like, hey, you got to start holding Robin accountable after everything that happened with their Patreon. But I think the same way they put Robin on notice, I think Giselle is on notice. And you also have to remember that unfortunately, just like Andy, some of these top people, executives, they actually don't understand what's happening with the higher consciousness. 
with the big, with the collective, like the us people sitting here talking and dissecting and understanding it and having, you know, more of a lived relatable experience to these women and what's going on. They look at it more as like, oh, this is the show and this is this, and they don't even get it, which is a lot of times why Watch What Happens Live and the reunion and Bravo YouTube channel and their Instagram and all this is so, and like, even like, articles are so off the mark and completely tone deaf. That's a big reason why um, Andy flopped so much at the reunion with Monique versus Candace, because the higher ups and Andy thought, oh, the, the collective is against Monique when the collective actually was for Monique when it came to that. And that's why he flopped so much. So they're doing a lot of catch up to actually get the pulse of us. A hundred. I mean, I think also there was kind of like an ulterior motive of that Monique Runian from Andy. I, I, I don't, I kind of got the impression from from him, you know, watching the shows, but kind of like... What, he might have been tone, jealous of Monique himself. Yeah, I think so, possibly. I mean, in the sense of um, a, a high chance, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but But, you know, aside from like the exceptions of... Um, Wait one second, Adam. Oh, I have to say this. Oh, you don't have a house? I have four homes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that part. <laughs> right? I have four homes. And that's exactly <laughs> when it started. Exactly. And that was it. Oh, you don't have you don't have a house? Oh, I have I have four. I have four homes. <laughs> also, just to jump in really quick, he uh she also said like that little check, like she called Bravo's yes. check a little check. So like, that, little 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 yeah. check. that was savage. That, yeah, that it was, was savage. savage. And then Andy was like, well, he doesn't play if, if for the in, in NFL anymore or whatever. And she's like, yeah, but we have a portfolio of investments. Like, get out of here. Like, he doesn't know how to manage his money. He probably has more money than Andy. I'm, I mean, the, the thing with Andy is, that aside from the likes of Kyle, if, um, you know, he he did for some for some reason like a, I I remember seeing this uh, many years back people were saying on um twitter which uh, now x how people like a lot of the housewives originally when they first came onto these shows like yeah did some of them have money but like with like the you franchises like he likes the people he can kind of control you know someone like brandy glanville or giselle you know they would li- uh in the words of my friend Freddie, with what he said, he you know, they they would lick the floor of Walmart to stay on the show. Those types of people, <laughs> uh, uh, and and you know, he, Giselle and Teresa and these Kyle types, you know, they could do no wrong in the eyes of Andy. And it it's you know, e- even if you, um, you know, you couldn't reason with him and. You know, I feel kind of like with um, with 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 Potomac, you know, I think you know for the whole thing of Ka- Candace leaving, I think you know, um, I don't like her, but I can, you know, as you know, looking at it as a show from a critic's point of view, she's not a cast member that makes me fall asleep, but I don't vibe with her. That's kind of how I I I. I, I I sum her up. I found, I find her at times just um, a, 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 annoying, to, to be frank. But she she has her good valid points, and as you know, smart woman, and what have you. But you know, with the show, I kind of feel that with season six, instead of them finding, you know, another f- person like Monique or or some person you know of Karen's stature like they just totally didn't and you know they brought Mia in the show and 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 these people like Wendy I just find them just preachy and Mm -hmm. and and I I, I'm not watching reality television to be preached um you know I'm watching it to have a fun time I don't think Andy likes Wendy well, I don't like Agreed. her either, to be honest with you. I don't, I find, I found her, you know, I don't, I'm not in my university classroom whilst watching television. Like, you know, I get that's your job and that's your profession, well respected, but I'm not here for someone to preach me. 
and that's kind of the the vibes that I get from her. But to but to me, ever since season six, there's been no reason for one Dixon's wife to be on this show. She is just the Nat of Potomac. She should have got checked five hundred years ago. Quite frankly, you know, mm-hmm. like to to me. As soon as they found Candace in season three, she should have been fired then. <laughs> because, and, I, and, I, and that's coming from me who doesn't like Candace, but I can say, as I said, she's not someone who makes me fall asleep. You know, the, the scenes with with Robin are just not, not worth my time. I mean, and Candace is also a storyline for a lot of people. Yeah, and including that person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but... But I, I kind of think the, the energy I think Potomac needs is kind of someone, I would like Mooney, Karen, but what would be better is if they could find someone in, in Potomac who's kind of got um, the Camille Grammer style. Mm-hmm. The wit, the shades, has something to display, and is far from boring. Mm-hmm. If you had to say... Other than the two who have left the show with the remaining cars, the Siphon Karen, who would you say is the second person that adds to the show that's on the show? Because, like, you know, Siphon Karen, to me, honestly, other... I would say, I would say NECA, because I think that she has more to offer than what she gave, and the other women have had enough time. And I like her style. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, I I would actually like disagree about my position on Wendy. Um, yeah, I think ahead. that she adds good texture to the group. I think that she adds balance as well in regards to um, her intellect and just like her positioning. Um, she's also, she's not so much on the let me drink the Candace Kool-Aid train to the point where if Candace is wrong, she doesn't know how to hold her friend accountable. And at the same time, she's able to at least meet the other half of the group that she doesn't like halfway. Mm -hmm. There were points at which during the reunion where the other women on the other side of the couch would say something and she would either like nod at agreement or, you know, she was able to like internalize it. Whereas, you know, Giselle, Robin and Ashley, they're like a stone wall. Like when they've collectively made the decision that they're going to go after someone, they don't budge on that. And at least Wendy's yep. able to meet them halfway. And I think that also going back to like that return and investment thing, you know, that gives her her longevity as well, because at least she can move forward with the cast. She has her own stuff as well. So I think that she does add something um, to the cast. Um, I don't think like in its in this current uh, configuration of eight women, I don't think she's being utilized most effectively, but she has potential. Mm-hmm. I would like to see if Wendy stays. I I would like to see Wendy and Neca like team up because yes. I think yeah, yeah, like Nigerian women. Like when I heard that they had another Nigerian woman coming on. Chelsea, can you guys hear her? No, she I got can't. cut off. No, I think no. she got cut off. Chelsea, Chelsea, go out and come back in or click back in because we want to hear you, sweetheart. Anybody else want to sound off? I, I think towards the end, I, I don't. I wasn't really a NECA fan either. I think she came in too hot trying to fight other people's battles. Mm -hmm. Um, There's something about the last two episodes where um, she she became a little more likable for me. Mm -hmm. And I think um, she was able to meet Candace and Wendy halfway and and, um, really help call out Ashley for her shenanigans and... uh, you know, she was on that side of the couch with Giselle and Robin, and every once in a while she would chime in and try to hold them accountable as well. 
So um, that mm-hmm. for me made her a little more likable than where she started at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I also think like Mia's like low key coming for the top spot. Um, I think she, you know, I don't know, you know, for how long they're going to keep Giselle or not, but I think Mia wants to be the top person on this show. And um, I think she's not as loyal maybe to the, to the green eyed bandits um, as maybe they think she is to them. So that's like another thing I kind of, I kind of got like a whiff of, I was like, Hmm, I don't know. I feel like Mia definitely wants the top spot in the show for sure. And though I don't like Mia, like obviously like as a person, I do feel like, the storyline that she brings and like, you know, her crazy drama with her husband. I mean, you know, her soon to be ex-husband and then her like DJ boyfriend or her, what did she say? Radio personality radio boyfriend. Radio personality. Um, <laughs> radio like, personality. <laughs> yeah. Maybe as a YouTube channel like me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I just think, I think she, she brings a lot. And like some of the stuff that Mia says is just so friggin' funny when she was just like, first of all, he's not a rapper. Yeah. <laughs> I could not. I was like, Mia, you're hilarious. So I feel like, I don't know how, you know, people here feel about her I, I i i like her as far as like i think she's good for reality tv because she's just like such a mess mm-hmm. so yeah i love it yeah the, ugh, these ladies it's funny because nobody talked about ashley <laughs> and that's why she's Ash- on the, the couch that's why Ash- ashley can go it's time for her to go she needs to stop lying about this fake divorce from Michael. It's not happening. You're not rubbing a man's feet every night in a house you allegedly don't live in if you plan to divorce him. I, I think they're I in the it, same I think what you said earlier about him buying the house, him buying the house for her not, you know, this is your house but you can film it. That, that's 100%. It I mean, uh, the thing with Ashley is that when I first started watching the show, uh, her, um, Karen, Monique, and her were my top three. But as time kind of has gone on, like, you know, I kind of feel, you know, I like her, but I don't love to watch her type of thing. Like, I I, I kind of feel that that's kind of gone over the years. And I, what I would have liked kind of like in a different world is if, if uh, if the Candace and Monique thing never happened, if I I I would have seen you know just a younger version, but then again, as um, as I want I want the um shows to kind of also kind of just have that organicness of people kind of knowing each other to a certain degree, you know, with the whole um New York revamp thing, no. Yeah. They all try to pretend that they knew each other, but like that was fake as that was just so phony. That was spurious, as um, one would say. And and uh, I don't want to see any spurious content. Like that's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> like, but but in in terms of all the franchises, I I I didn't watch this. Neither did I watch Salt Lake City kind of religiously because both of them were tough for me but out of those t- two shows was Potomac easier to watch I don't know like what do you guys think <laughs> out of Salt Lake City I think for me Salt Lake City was easier to watch it wasn't as dark as Potomac has got had gotten it got to be very fake and weird but I think they were hard to watch in like two different ways if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy they fired what's her face, Monica. If they would have brought Monica back, I would have been out. I mean, they could have fired Whitney with her, but I'm glad Monica's gone. Yeah. But yeah. Because uh, Whit- Whitney just gives off big energy with her grandpa husband. I don't know. Like... Yeah. But. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. But what. 
what's what's worse Potomac coming back with the six cast members that aren't leaving the show that haven't been announced or we see Beverly Hills return with Crystal and Dorit still holding a diamond wait what was that first part so either Ashley, Wendy, Karen, Mia, aka everyone but Candace and Robin comes back okay. with one extra brand new person. Okay. Or Beverly Hills comes back and somehow Dorit and Crystal are still holding diamonds. Worse would be the Potomac situation. I agree. Like eat by I far. Agree too. By far. Because we'll have Dorit versus Kyle. That's clearly going to be next season. Like, that's just, it's going to be Dorit versus Kyle next season, 100%. And Crystal is essentially a friend of anyway. And then when she does choose to clock in, she does a good job. So that would be fine. But to keep this cast and just one extra person, no. Because we need to get rid of Ashley. We need to get rid of, I think Giselle could take a pause. I would keep NECA, Karen, we can let go of Mia. Out of Mia and Wendy, I would keep Wendy. Uh, out of Mia and... I mean... For me, if I had to choose just by a pinch, it probably would be when... I, I, actually, I don't know. They're both hard for me to watch. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad uh, you brought up... Oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm glad that you you brought up Beverly Hills because I feel like Giselle's almost like the Lisa Renna of the group in that mm. as long as she's on the show, she creates a blockage for the rest of the cast to not progress forward. Yep. And I I can't believe that producers or someone like behind the scenes told all the women that they're on probation going into the reunion and and Giselle still acted the way she did because I felt like she was still just as stubborn as most of the season I think I think almost um not only was she like knocked down to second chair but it also seemed like they didn't give her the same grace in terms of editing that we've seen yep. in the past as well because allegedly back in season uh five when Monique had her binder there was talks about mm -hmm. Giselle having like unraveled during the set and she like lost her cool at one point, but you never saw that edited anywhere into the show. Whereas like this season or like this, this reunion, she, she felt different. I don't know if the rest of you guys agree, but there was something about seeing like Candace crying and then Giselle being like juxtaposed right next to it, like laughing about it. Like it just felt very, um, just really evil to watch that I think in previous seasons like that that editing protection would have been granted to her no you're 100% spot on because even, even Andy um, said oh that was kind of mean to, to Giselle right, about right. Candace remember and I've never heard Andy ever speak against Giselle I don't know if it was Andy echoing what producers were saying in his ear but regardless whether it was Andy and producers or just Andy or just producers, they took Candace's side, which is very rare. Because when Candy, because you're, you're right, that's 100% spot on. When she started crying and she was kind of like cackling at her, they're like, well, yeah, like that's kind of mean. And I was shocked because I've never heard them call Giselle out. And to call her mean? Spot on. I, I think with with a uh... The dynamics of the reunion i think you know all of us were shocked that you know she wasn't given first chair and you know clearly something happened because giselle um claimed from the get-go just kind of like kyle how she was the developer of potomac you know oh i you know i you karen i you sharice you know i i made this show i helped the show get in development and what have you and Kyle does the same on Beverly Hills. But I think kind of the difference with um, Giselle and Kyle in this kind of power ego phase is that 
Kyle kind of just un- just by luck just has that um, ammunition of kind of uh, being extra friendly in a monetary way by um, throwing parties, flying people in private jets. You know, her relationship with the Beverly Hills producers is is pretty sus. I mean, you know, I I don't think many other shows operate like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know any other show where producers are flying on private jets to someone's Aspen house or anything like oh, that. Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's happening. <laughs> oh, it's happening. Like, look at the Hollywood Reckoning, where now it's all coming out. Certain people are having, like, parties and perks and all this other crazy oh my God, stuff. I was just going to say the same thing. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I was just going to no, say No, you're thing. fine. No, you're fine. Like, um, I'm not talking about it in depth on my channel because it's too dark, but I it, ma- it just makes you realize how much behind the scenes nefarious I'll, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back weird dealing is. Like that it's not just by luck or talent or not even just like oh I know a guy for all these people getting rich and famous how there's all these like crazy other things going on so I mean the fact that Kyle flies them out on a private jet is kind of like the most innocent of things we've been hearing (laughs) of things that have been going on yeah you know (laughs) yeah I I heard I was just talking like in compared to like the other franchises yeah. of the health kind of, of like the, just the upper yeah. echelon, the upper echelon you, power you never you thing. never i mean you never know but you never but know in ter- in, but in terms of um the, the the reunion also kind of to me the trailer didn't excite me you know the trailers of the reunions mm-hmm. typically like you know, whether that's Vanderpump, Beverly Hills, Atlanta, the trailers typically are the parts that excite me. I mean, with um, I mean, as we said in the previous live, Candy, we were like, you know, the tr- maybe the trailer for Beverly Hill, the Beverly Hills reunion, would be more entertaining than the actual reunion, but like, which it pro- which it pretty much was, but. You know, the trailers for, for this Potomac reunion didn't excite me one bit, really, in all honesty. Like, it kind of was just kind of D-tier energy. I think I think what happens is that, like, we already know. Like, there's no more surprises. I think that's a big thing. Like, when was the last time where you, like, genuinely surprised by something that came out on a show or on a reunion that we didn't already know? The last episode of Salt Lake City because I wasn't expecting. See, that well, you here. should have been yeah. a candy cane because we had already <laughs> talked about that. I um, <laughs> did actually. I think we was did, but I yeah. kind of just like maybe brushed it off. Yeah, maybe you brushed <laughs> it like, off. Whatever. You gotta pay. You gotta pay close attention because we had already cracked that case. <laughs> Yeah, I guess because like I guess I wasn't. That was probably the first time I was like in a really long time. Yeah, yeah. But like you know, my bad. I I wasn't like watching you as much during that time. Sorry. No, I'm just (laughs) just teasing, sweetheart. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. But like I think that was, and and even that was very like, and I actually think it's, I actually think like, reality TV is obviously really good when it's organic. But I think what Heather showed us even in the last like episode of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City was that like you can manufacture things and you can play chess but if you as long as you do it well it could still be good TV and I don't even think like R I you know RHOP obviously like isn't doing that I don't think like I, I think like them putting all their eggs in one basket like making like the Giselle like the face of the show I think she's just you know you guys have already said it but like she's bringing the show down and like she just wants to keep her check and anybody who challenges her she just like ices them out and I think like you like you guys already said like we already know kind of like everything that's happening but I think we also just feel like the energy of the show we know that really none of the girls like each other um and even the ones that 
kind of do and are genuine and the ones that we do like they're kind of being pushed out so it's just like not exciting to watch because they're just like arguing about nothing really if you kind of think about it and then at the same time like you just see a few women on the show just being treated so unfairly it's just like it's just not fun to watch it's just it's too dark i think going into next season mm -hmm. i want to see them and this is like wishful thinking but if they brought on two women at the same time, and that way it would eliminate the hazing aspect of the show. Because it seems like every season they go after one woman and she gets targeted until she either is put in like a physical confrontation or she leaves or something else. Um, and to that end, I think having like two women on the show kind of like harkens back to like season three of Atlanta, if you think about it, because that was like one of the actually season three and season five were two times where like they brought on two women simultaneously. And so they're, they're trying to like navigate each other, but also navigate the group. And then it also eliminates like the hazing aspect. And I think that the hazing is what makes the show feel really dark and kind of like unpleasant to watch. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it would be cool if instead of like, cause they try and always force or lie or manipulate and act like this new person is friends with somebody already on the cast. Like, I think instead of that, if it would be nice if they brought two people and like they were friends joining the group or they had some sort of, you know, connection, that would be interesting. I think, cause I think like we, we saw it with, um, with Kiowa or Kiowa with K on the show. Like supposedly she was brought in through Wendy and Candace, but then at the fight, she's the one who gets hit in the head and nobody even cares for her. Giselle is the one going to look after her when she's sick at, at the girl's trip. Like that's not really your friend. Do you know what I mean? And then with Anne Marie with Beverly Hills, like then Kyle was like, I don't know that girl. I only met her once when she was like a flop and, but she was supposed to be Kyle's friend. It mm -hmm. kind of makes it so weird when it's like, and then the person coming in feels this sort of, and like NECA was supposed to be Ashley's friend coming in. They have this sort of forced loyalty to this person that who is scripted to be the person who brought them on. And then they sort of lose their identity and being that person's mouthpiece. We've seen that happen time and time again. So I agree. I think bringing in two people and then making whatever connection they have authentic and true. Because there's other reality shows like I made I watch Made in Chelsea. That's like a UK show. And when they bring in new people, they don't pretend like they're friends. They'll be like, oh, we were out at the bar and we met this hot girl. Now she's in our friends. But they don't pretend like, oh, this is my friend I've known for 10 years and now we're bringing her in the group. So I do well, think yes. that there's ways Obviously. for them to be like – like, like, if, like, like, for example, if Kyle would have been like, oh, I met this girl at this part at a party we had. Her name is Anna Marie. I'm just getting to know her. I want to introduce her to the group. That would have made more sense than being like, this is my new friend, Anna Marie. She lives in the same street as me. She's really cool. She comes over and we ha play and we work out and she's an uh, anesthesiologist. And now she's going to go attack Sutton about her esophagus. Like, it was, you know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe I'm rambling, but this is how I felt. No, Amory I understand was, what oh, you mean. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Go ahead, y'all. Sound off. You go, Adam. Uh, I was just saying, but uh, Chelsea's back. In... I'm back. Sorry, y'all. Oh, boyfriend Chelsea! Called, my boyfriend called me and it booted me off. <laughs> Ooh, la, la. Mwah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, sorry. But yeah, I was just saying that, like, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping for Wendy and Neka to get it together and, mm -hmm. um, you know, regroup and team up and then i think cephas i heard you while i was in the background but when production didn't expose like giselle for having that meltdown i was like the favoritism right there so i know candy we talked about it like a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. about the colorism topic and you were saying mm -hmm. that like not really because colorism or favoritism and i see that now and i kind of see um i just i see it i see it i still yeah. um I know that there is colorism as a light-skinned woman myself. Like, I definitely acknowledge treatments that I can receive. So I don't want to, like, um, 
be what's the word I'm looking for disrespectful um, mm-hmm. to do that. But I think that sometimes Candace is reaching a little bit and yeah, hundred percent. it kind of showed in this, in this reunion, this episode, like after this, like when Cephas said that he kind of wished that like, we didn't know Candace was leaving. Cause it kind of like put a little stain on while watching it mm-hmm. to me. I was just like, what well, kind of makes sense why she's not coming back. And I don't think that Giselle phased her out, but I'm just like, you, it's just apparent, you know, that they're, they're just, they're not friends. And I, I don't see them coming together. I don't see Giselle budging. Um, and like you said, just be honest about how, when you bring these people and how you, and how, and, and how you meet them. And when you bring them on, don't act like they're really good friends. And like how Kyle said, I don't even know the person. Um, and then someone in the chat said, Kyle's trying to bring on another, someone's wife that lives in New York. I'm like, no more, no more of that, please. Like, oh yeah, like Baldwin's wife. Oh yeah, Alec Baldwin's wife. Like, Baldwin, no, we don't, Baldwin, like, no, we don't want no. that. We don't want and that. And we don't need her. She appropriates um, Hispanic culture, doesn't she? She pretends. I, to I be... have no. I, I have no idea about her. But like, we yeah, don't... no, she's like a. She's like a. Oh, like she's crazy. She's insane. White woman <laughs> from like Connecticut. She's like Dorit. She's like a hundred percent white from Connecticut, but, but she a part acts of me, like she's Spanish. If I can say, a part of me is like Matt. I'm just like I'm not disappointed. I don't know. I, it incy bit feel bad for Anne Marie in the sense of like I feel bad that she fell for Kyle's like who knows what Kyle was telling Anne Marie like I have your yeah. back like I got you in this and like you know while they're filming she's not aware of what they're putting together and what they're going to piece together so this whole time all it was was esophagate like esophagate like it just I hope for people that come on in the future just really rock with your own mind. Like don't let yep. someone else try to like puppeteer you. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's just what I agree with. And, and I think it was, it Raji? Is it yeah. Raji? Mm-hmm. Hey Raji. So Hi. I, you, you like Candace. I don't mind Candace. Like I really don't mind her, but I just wish that she, cause I love how she can read. I love how she can read with her words. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, slice the tongue. But sometimes I'm like, Candace, you eat black crow because you can't talk about someone's dwindling uterus when they have carried three children with that uterus while you're crying about not having a baby yourself. You know, it just, it really like, it's so cringe because I like her too. I'm like, Candace, you have to like watch what you say. You know, it's it's not cute. It's not funny. Like that I think is what gives viewers like, uh, and then more favor to like Giselle. And it's like, we don't want to favor Giselle because Giselle's still wrong. I agree that I think Candace should have gave her all that heat when Giselle word played on her husband, because Mm -hmm. you try to come after my husband and you try to act like he hit on you. I really think that Giselle, because she thinks she has pretty privilege and all that, she probably was offended because Chris didn't hit on her. And she came up with that storyline. Like ever since she did what she did with Monique, and Candace knew about that. I also feel like Candace, you should have played your cards correctly too. You know, like don't think that she wasn't going to come after you. And I just feel like that's kind of how it played out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like think she's going to go after you. Yeah, I think like, like I, I know I, it seems like the consensus, at least with a couple people here, is that you know the colorism on the show is a little bit or claiming that there's colorism on the show is a little bit reaching. Um, I do think that there are other factors as well, but I also think that there's colorism like on the show for sure. Um, I think too, and it's just my opinion, you know, feel free to disagree, but like, I think to, to say like, oh, this situation didn't have colorism or this situation didn't have racism or this situation didn't have misogyny. I don't know if I, really almost in any situation if I can 100% say those things because those things are always are always present you know like if you're in a situation like as a like let's just say as a woman right and you're like with a group of men like and something happens and then you claim oh well I think that was kind of misogynistic like I think you can argue how much of it plays a role into the situation you can I think you can say like oh like I don't think it was really totally 100% misogyny. I'm sure it has a small part to play in it, but I I don't think it's the, the biggest thing. And you know, maybe you guys feel that about Potomac, but I just think to say that it's not a factor at all, I just think it's just like, I'm trying to word this like correctly. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I don't I think just, that we're saying that that race that colorism doesn't exist or it's not a factor. Yeah, I think, yeah, and I'm not saying that yeah, either. Yeah. I think people, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone here is saying colorism doesn't exist. But I just yeah. think in some situations, like, I think people are so quick because I, I think people are so quick to say like, oh, it's not racism, oh, it's not colorism, oh, it's not you know this or that or whatever. I think. I, I just think personally, you can't ever f fully 100% like rule those things out in any situation. And I don't think that ne it necessarily means that in every situation, oh, it's it's racism or oh, it's colorism or oh, it's misogyny or oh, whatever isms there are. But I don't think you can like totally rule it out because it's always because it's just so ever present in our society. It's so ever present in our institutions. It's so ever present in everything that I don't think it's something that you can rule out in almost any situation i think you can like debate up how much of a factor it plays into it but i don't think it could ever be ruled out and as far as candace and the dwindling uterus comment i'm not laughing because like <laughs> i'm not saying that that was okay to say but i just think like no i feel you when you get pushed and pushed and pushed so far and you get bullied and you're getting iced out like i just i don't know what like because even if she like didn't react like Giselle still would have like treated her the same like regardless Giselle wanted to ice out Candace Giselle wanted Candace off the show and you know for for whatever reason so <laughs> that's why I'm kind of just like well Candace can kind of say whatever she wants because Giselle kind of does whatever she wants so I don't really I guess I don't really mind it and maybe I'm like kind of mean I guess but I just think Giselle's really evil so I think to fight evil sometimes you got to be a little evil <laughs> but that's just my take yeah, I just hate how Giselle gets away with. She just gets. They just. She gets away with it. But like Candice, Candy, you said she. She's in second seat. So hopefully, um, she brings it. You know, next season with her own story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and Giselle getting second seat doesn't just send a message to Giselle. It sends a message to the entire cast of like nobody's safe anymore. Because a lot of just like how we were saying um, Giselle was like Lisa Renna when they fired Lisa Renna that also sent a not just the message to her, but to the rest of the cast too that like nobody's safe because the reason why people like Lisa Renna or Giselle hold power is because people believe they have it. So once you take that sort of like invisible power they have away, that frees people up to form their own organic friendships and own their own autonomy. And mm -hmm. when it comes to like um, to colorism on Real Hop, of course, colorism is a factor the way racism is or ageism or sexism or homophobia is because it's very subconscious or unconscious or insidious or, in or institutionalized. So that's almost – unfortunately a given but what i think it that it plays a particular role in our subconscious and our psyche like even as a woman i have misogyny in me because i live in a patriarchal system you know we all have those biases but i'm obviously not a misogynist right but i think that when it comes to the colorism on potomac i think the, the biggest question is I felt Candace was using colorism as a way to deflect from taking accountability for her own words and actions. That does not negate the fact that Giselle is also evil and wrong and has done horrible things. Both of those worlds exist. The reason, But the biggest thing is I don't think that the majority of people dislike Candace because of the color of her skin. I think the majority of people dislike yeah. Candace because of her attitude, because of the words that she said, because of her own. She's in a very intellectually intelligent, but she was very emotionally um, not intelligent. She's gained emotional intelligence. And the reason why, again, I don't think it's really colorism is because she's gained favor as she's grown and as she's gotten therapy and gotten better and everything, I think the collective on Candace has gotten, at least I'll speak personally, I warmed up to her. I like her more. She's become more likable because she as a person has evolved, not because the color of her skin has changed. That, But that doesn't negate the fact that Giselle is still a horrible person and hasn't grown and hasn't changed. And her, the color of her skin hasn't changed, but her favorability has. 
she's the one who got knocked out of the first seat. She's the one sitting, sitting, you know, next to Karen, second seat. She's the one who's, you know, mouthpiece, bulldog, Robin just got fired. And her skin color hasn't <laughs> changed. But she, who she is hasn't changed. She's just been more re- revealed. So I think if it was really the colorism thing, then there would be zero consequences for Giselle and no one would ever change their opinion on Candace, but that's not true. And so for me, that was more of what it was for me, colorism. I don't know if you guys watched um, basketball wives, but with like OG and with um, Shawnee and uh, what's her name? Evelyn. That was like crystal clear. Yeah. Colorism. Crystal clear colorism. Like yeah, the way they were terrible. coming at this woman was so disgusting. It was so blatant. It makes your stomach turn, you know? Mm-hmm, and that mm-hmm. was absolutely awful because they really were coming for her because of her features, because of the color of her skin, for how she looked, monkey emojis. Like it was sickening. And OG. I think at the very end, she kind of did it herself a disservice, but that's a totally different conversation. But OG in general, she wasn't using colorism to deflect from her own actions. She was saying, no, I am the victim of colorism and this is why, and I'm speaking out because this is what is happening to me and it's not right or fair. And she was 100% correct in that. So that to me is the difference between colorism on Rohop versus colorism and like other spaces Mm -hmm. that's kind of where I landed with it yeah and I think I think I partially you know I partially agree with that in the sense that like I don't think colorism like is the worst it's ever been or the worst I've ever seen it on you know on uh on row hop I think I think for me I, I think all of those things you said about you know Candace and everything I think all of that's true but I also I also think that like you while you can benefit from colorism it doesn't mean that you're like 100 percent safe you know just like how you can be a white person and benefit from racism it doesn't make you 100 percent safe in all situations you know like a- anybody can be humbled anybody can get dethroned so i do think like part for me at least what i've seen i think when candace reacts she at least the woman on the show i when she reacted to things, she was being called aggressive. When Wendy reacted to things, she was being called aggressive. When all of the women have been aggressive, Robin almost fought Monique. <laughs> she had like her Ro- finger in her face. Rob- they called Robin aggressive. They've called Robin out on that. Yeah, I think, but I, I don't think yeah. it was to the extent that they called that they called out Wendy and Candace. I think it was just like immediately, like. They called Robin aggressive because what Robin was doing was so obviously aggressive. Like you can't, it's like undeniably aggressive. Like her behavior was undeniably aggressive. I think when Candace and Wendy like simply just like speak up for themselves or just say like, hey, like, I don't find that cool. Like watch what you're saying to me, like sit down. They get called aggressive, you know? So that I think that for me is like where I see the colorism. And I don't think it's like, the only factor, Candace definitely has a big mouth. I do think Candace kind of like switches back and forth when she wants to use colorism and then when she doesn't want to use colorism. I think if colorism wasn't affecting her, she probably would say colorism isn't on the show. So I do think she kind of flip, flip-flops flip with it as my, well. My question with that, though, is do they not like Candace and Wendy because of the color of their skin or do they just not not like Candace and Wendy? I think like... Because Karen. I don't, I don't, I don't think that I don't think at the core of it. Because, like we said, all of the isms are insidious and in, and institutionalized. So I'm not saying that there's not something baked in because mm-hmm. there's something mm-hmm. baked in all of us. At the yeah. end of the day, we all have it baked in in us in our society. Like that's just how it is. So mm-hmm. I'm talking about the core of it. Yeah. At the core of it, for it to be colorism, I don't think the reason why they don't like Candace and Wendy is because of the color of their skin. I think they don't like Candace and Wendy because at the core of it, they are jealous of them. I was just going to say the same I, I, thing. I think, yeah, I, think it, I think it's jealousy. I don't think it's colorism. I think, I think it's jealousy. But I think that like when... Jealous of Monique. But, the, but, but, but the society that we live in optics and again because it's baked in us so we have preconceived notions when we see two light-skinned blonde green-eyed bandits go after two women who are darker than them 
Maybe it's our own institutionalized ism that just assumes, oh, you don't like them because they're darker than you. Yeah, I, but I, the thing is, I maybe also that, feel maybe like that's, maybe that's our own stuff coming up because I don't think that they don't like them because of the color of their skin. I think they don't like them because they're jealous. I think they're definitely jealous. And I think for me, once again, this is just my take. And like, as far yeah, as yeah, colorism, yeah, yeah. like, you know, I, I've heard a lot of the arguments and I think I'm sticking with it because like, I, I just feel like Karen has also like read Giselle and Robin to filth. And I just don't think, I don't see them like getting as mad. Like Ashley caused so much havoc her first few seasons. And not that that not that Ash not that they didn't go after Ashley, and not that Ashley didn't have repercussions, but I just feel like the second Wendy, especially, went against Giselle and went against Robin, it was like this immediate like cut reaction. And I think jealousy is definitely definitely has a part to play in it for sure, absolutely. But I also think kind of going along with that, I also think like, and maybe it's maybe for them it's very subconscious. Maybe they're not even aware of it. I think probably a lot throughout their lives, Giselle and Robin have always been kind of told, most likely, that they're better than women who look like Giselle and Candace, whether implicitly or explicitly, or whether like directly or indirectly, they've been told, that, or they, they think subconsciously that they're better than women like Candace and Wendy, and then women like Candace and Wendy come on the show, and they're living a better life than them. So it's just kind of like, you yeah, know, but, they, I, but they've. But the thing is, they've they have gone after Karen and Ashley yeah. and, and and Mia. Yeah, they did so go after that. Katie they've gone girl, after. Right? They the went Katie after Katie, was, but they haven't iced them out. Is what I'm saying. They just haven't like iced them out the way they have Candace and Wendy. Well, but but also the relationship they have with them is different from the relationship they have with Candace. Like what has transpired between Candace and Giselle is very different than what has transpired between Giselle and a Wendy or Giselle and an Ashley or a Giselle and a Karen. You can't True. compare th those situations because their relationship is so different and the demise of their relationship is so, so different. So it's not, it's apples to oranges with that one. And then when it, but, and then also Sharice is the same color as, um, Candace and they love Sharice. They don't talk down to her. They don't, when Sharice gets drunk and loud and going crazy, they don't call her aggressive. They laugh with Sharice. The, so again, I think it's more about like, do, I think it's more about who they like and who they don't like, not necessarily because it's the person's skin color. Well, well yeah, but I also think it's kind of like, like, let's say like, I don't really, like, you know, because I'm a black woman, right? So, like, let's say, like, I don't, I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying yeah. this is how I am in real life. But yeah. let's say, like, I don't really, like, I don't really mess with white people like that. You know, let's say, like, I just, most of my friends are black or other people of color. But I have, like, this kind of, like, one white friend, you know? Like, oh, but I can't dislike white people because I have, like, a white friend. You know what I mean? And I feel like with Sharice, she was kind of, like, actually really the top dog of the show in the sense that she's the one who had a lot of connections she actually did have money. So I don't think like strategically just, and this is just my take once again, um, I don't think strategically they were just gonna go up against Sharice, Sharice like that. And maybe but they just genuinely Sharice, like Sharice, Sharice too. Sharice is the one who got fired from her own she show. She did, she did. Has and no I think power to get back and is now a friend of doing everything she can to get back. And they absolutely. team up with Sharice to go against um, Karen who is light skinned. All the time, yeah. they they try to go against Karen. I think if you say that all of these women, this the, all of the women, say they all were purple. They all were the same shade of purple. How would it, how, and they were all treating it or like this. What would it be the reason? The reason would be because this is a person I like. This is a person I don't like. This is somebody I'm jealous of. This is someone I'm attacking. It, it has nothing to do with the, with the color or anything, because nothing points to that. Whereas with like basketball wives, if they were all purple, it would be because I don't like this person's shade of purple. I don't like this person's nose, how it looks in purple, because that's explicitly what they said and explicitly what happened. I just don't see any concrete evidence or any example of 
overt colorism because as we've all agreed on isms are are baked in they're they're inherent within us but i haven't seen an example of they're doing this to, to someone because of the color of their skin yeah i mean i i don't think it necessarily has to be overt i think I it think for, be, I think for it to be colorism and with a big C, it does need to be overt because, like well, we said, well, colorism with like, a small C, of course, it's baked in. And colorism, unlike racism, works both ways. There are people who are light, who are lighter skinned, who gets treated poorly because people again have internal racism where they think, "Oh, you're light skinned. You think you're better than me. Who do you think you are?" And they will treat that person worse. Well, it's I think not, like, colorism isn't just a one way street, unfortunately, because it is the bastard of racism. It works both yeah. ways, and I think because it is the bastard of the bastard of racism, I think while like while yeah, there are light skinned people who do feel ostracized, who do get told, "Oh, you think you're this, and you think you're that because you're light, because you're light skinned." I agree with time. that. It happens. But, you know, and I'm, I'm, not, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not, not saying that's what's happening on Potomac. I don't think. Yeah. That, but I think that there, I, I just haven't heard or seen a reasonable or rational explanation of how what's happening is colorism with a capital C. Because yeah, there's no think... way to bake. There's no like it's like if you bake a cake, there's no way to separate the flour from the cake. There's no way to separate institutionalized isms. So it's baked in. But is it a chocolate cake or is it a vanilla cake? Is it a strawberry cake? You know what I mean? Like that's what we were really talking about. Because those yeah. isms, you 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 can't separate it. So what? Yeah, yeah. So what makes sure. this cake chocolate? What makes this cake vanilla? What makes this colorism with a capital C? I, I would say it's not colorism with a capital C, but I wouldn't say it's colorism with <laughs> necessarily a lowercase C. <laughs> I think it's somewhere in the because, middle. Because and it's been I, there. Yeah, and, it's, and, I, it's been there. and I also think that, like, you know, as far as, like, I kind of use this analogy, like, it's kind of like with racism, like, mm -hmm. I live in an area where the racism, it, it, it's not, like, as overt as it would be somewhere, like, stereotypically right, like, in the South, like, just like stereotypes of like how how it would be to like be a black person living in the South, right? Mm -hmm. But I live in an area where it's not necessarily super overt, but it's like a lot of microaggressions. So yeah. living in an area where it's like, it's a lot of microaggressions, it's not overt. If you take a lot of like single situations, for me example that I've been in, you'd be like, oh, is that necessarily racism? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But it's like, I feel like microaggressions versus just overt racism is like, do you want to be like shot by a gun or do you want like a death by like a thousand little cuts? Like that's kind of like how I, how I view it and how I compare it. And that's kind of like how I see the, uh, the colorism on uh, Real Housewives of Potomac. I think it's very like, it's, but I don't even it's see a the, bunch of little micro and, 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 and I'm not, and I'm not like, trying to, I'm, trust me, I'm, I'm not, not trying, I'm not it. trying to change your mind at all. Trust yeah. me, I'm not trying to change your mind at all. Yeah. 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 I, no way. I, I don't even see the micro because trust me, I'm a black woman in, in, in this world as well, as yeah. well. So trust me, yeah. I understand all, all, all of the isms on all of the sides, but yeah. I don't see, I don't even see the micro. I don't, cause I, it just, I just don't see how it's based on Candace's color or Wendy's color. I just see two women, and by two women, I mean Robin and Giselle, who are so bitter, unfulfilled, and and jealous, and miserable in their own lives. And when they see anybody else, and I'm not talking about color, I'm just talking about other women who have joy and love and spark and talent, I think it, I think that irks them. And the reason why they have such a visual response to Candace is because Candace is so, and this is where it gets tricky. Cause I think the fact that because Candace for how beautiful <laughs> and talented and everything she has, I do think at her core, she's still very insecure and she is so seeking their validation. So the fact that they yeah, don't I agree that. Vali so, so the mm -hmm. fact that they don't validate her, but the sick part is they don't validate her because they're jealous of her. 
because mm-hmm. they actually think she they actually she, they actually think she's there she's better than them. But Candace, yeah. because she's in her insecurity, she takes them not validating her as they think they're better than me when the the opposite is actually true. Mm-hmm. And so because Candace has that mouth and she has whatever, she she attack she retaliates back in a big way. So then it keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the sad part is it's really just women who are so deeply in their own wounding, who cannot see clearly fighting each other. When at the end of the day, if they just would stop, work on themselves and heal themselves, they probably would be really great friends. Because at the end of the day, they probably have more in common than they have not in common. So I see two people who are, or three or four, whatever you want to call it, who are deeply in their insecurity and deeply in their wounding. And they're not seeing themselves clearly and they're not seeing each other clearly. That's Mm -hmm. what I really see going on. And I don't think it has anything to do with anybody's skin color. Yeah. So um, I think like, (laughs) this this may sound kind of like a little bit weird, but um, (laughs) I almost feel like, and, and maybe I'm also a little bit biased because I just really don't like Giselle and Robin. I really just, I, I cannot like, stand trust them. Me, I don't like them either. I know you don't like them either. <laughs> if, I know I a thought, lot of if, people if, don't. Trust me. If I, if I saw colorism, I would be talking about it all day long. But yeah. I, but I, I just see, it's this, I, I just see really broken women. I just see broken women fighting. Yeah. And I think a lot of women who, you know, do have colorist tendencies, even if it's not overt, are, are, are broken people, you know, like, you know, even just to be very vulnerable, like, kind of like with myself, like, I'm a black woman, right? But I think at one point, you know, I thought, oh, I was kind of maybe better than other black women because uh, of my hair type. I obviously don't think mm-hmm. that now. But that was something that I had to, you know, work really hard, like to undo and, you know, yeah. you know, check myself and, you know, be like, hey, like, why do I actually think this? Like, yeah, wh- where where is this coming from? Is like, you know, and really dissect it. And I think I felt like that because I was a very broken person. And so mm-hmm. now, you know, I still have a lot to work on. Not to like make this about myself. <laughs> like a lot no, to work it's on. okay. You can but, talk. You know, I you're fine, sweetheart. I'm not like, you know, I I like to think at least to myself that I'm no longer like that. But even that, even as broken as I was, and even as, you know how much like I didn't like myself even if I did think those kind of things yeah. I never like acted on it you know I never made fun of somebody else's hair I never like really you know did anything of, of that sort and it wasn't a I didn't like actively or like what you like the word you stated like overtly act on my own internalized like texturism right mm-hmm. but I think like <laughs> I think it just may like sound kind of funny but I think like okay. Giselle Robin <laughs> especially Giselle maybe kind of had a thing like okay Atlanta has like a lot of dark skin girls so maybe this can be like the light skin black franchise <laughs> <laughs> and then it didn't end up being that so they're like oh. <laughs> but anyway yeah but yeah I think people you know obviously we can have different opinions I yeah, still course. I think there's colorism on the show yeah. I don't think it's as, overt as basketball wise basketball wise was just so obvious it was just so awful it was just so like so disgusting to to the point where like I, I literally couldn't even watch that show at all I just can yeah. watch clips. So I'm not really comparing bad. it to that. I, I think there's plenty of shows where colorism is way worse. I think there's plenty of situations where colorism is way worse. I like I said, I think Candace kind of like pussy paws for the colorism thing. <laughs> I think if she wasn't treated poorly by these women, she probably wouldn't say that at all. And she'd probably deny it if it was just towards Wendy. But I do think that, at least for me, I feel it in the show. I feel it with the woman and I I do think it's microaggressions, but that's just what I think. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being vulnerable. I really appreciate that. And, no. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. That was really yeah, good. Yeah. That was really good. And and don't feel alone because, like we said, like we all have certain M- isms baked in us. You know, whether it's right mm-hmm. or wrong, it's just how it is. And so, thank you so much for sharing. But I think also when it comes to to Candace, and then I'll let somebody else jump in if they want. Yeah, sorry. I'm done. No, 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 no. You're fine. I mean, I mean, for me, like I've been rambling. So <laughs> if anybody else wants to come in, I just think the part about Candace real quick is that I think if she got the validation that she so sought from Giselle and Robin, 
I don't think she would have said colorism. I agree. Because she because she would have gotten her validation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think with that being th- said, it kind of doesn't really give credence to her colorism claim. I think more than anything, yeah. it's not necessarily colorism. It's just a group of coworkers. Exactly. And that's exactly what it is. Like they're they're coworkers. Yes, yeah. there is the element of like um like featureism, colorism, xenophobia, but at its core, these are women who just have to work together. And to that end, there's a lack of emotion, a lack of humanity, even as far as like Gisela Times saying, like, I don't want to talk to it. Like she doesn't say yeah. like her, but she says, I don't want to talk to it. it. So you're literally robbing someone of their humanism. And I think that's the issue. Um interesting. Definitely. And on, on that note as well, I have to head out because it's midnight where I'm at. But thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to just sound off and yes. you know, speak my piece. Thank you for coming up. I loved um, all of your views and your opinions and I appreciate it. And I got to go too because it's getting late here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Caddy, it's, it's even late on my end. Uh, yeah. the, what's it, the clocks went forward just today and literally I, I just forgot. Like, <laughs> what's the time? Yeah, whilst we're on live, the clocks went forward. <laughs> it's just like lost the hour of sleep. So. <laughs> but um, but uh, definitely, um, when you have the time, like obviously, I know you're busy hustling. Um, mm-hmm. Watch Vanderpump Villa, just because, I, as I told you, it's there's for some reason there's a delay my way. Okay. Uh, and I I I want to hear your take on it because obviously you're to spell it out for me so. I've like to send me like a DM on Instagram and yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to hear your take on it. You got um, it. I will. But I it's, promise. It's been a, uh, it's been lovely uh, chatting and debating with you all and um, everyone give Candy's live a, a like. Oh, yes. thank you. you. Yes. Speak thank soon. You, Bye. Speak soon. Bye. 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 Bye thank Raji. You, thank girl. you so much. I just want to say real quick, yeah. um, mm-hmm. I'm really Sound late off. to the party. Like, I'm so late, but maybe for the Bravo lovers. Did you ever watch, uh, did you watch Shaw's The Sunset? I, di- I did watch a few seasons of it. Why did you stop watching it? I stopped watching it. Uh, I'm, I think I'm pretty much caught up, but with the whole, like, Reza and MJ and Mike situations, it just got too evil and dark. It got crazy. Let me just say, I just have to say, like watching mm-hmm. the watching the seasons back from like 2012, 2015, even have my boyfriend cracking up. He's like, <laughs> "How is this even on TV?" And I'm like, "Bro, like <laughs> these people would be canceled." And I just, to me, it's just it's comical. It's just it's a little bit of comedy for me because I'm like, these people are just. I'm not saying airhead. It's just like a little like airhead drama, you know, mm-hmm. it's just like funny to laugh off. And I just, I'm just kind of into that. Just like kind of catching up. But I'm like, I wonder if Candy watched that. I need to like find little recaps on them. But yeah, that was all. Um, thanks so much, Candy. You've been talking on here for four hours, girl. We I know. so appreciate you. We appreciate Yay! you. Thank yes. you. I appreciate you too. Go eat, girl, and I'm going to catch you <laughs> on the next live, hopefully. Yes. Thank you, sweetheart. Bye. Bye. Shout out to my beautiful panel. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Raji. Thank you, Cephas. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, everybody. And shout out to Miss T, Darren Hood, to Deborah, to everybody. Hi, Irene. What's up, sweetheart? Hey, Plexus Val. Hey, Felicia. What is up? I said hi. Hey, Annalise. Hey, Essie. Hey, Deb. All right. Hey, Miss Indies. What is up, sweetheart? Love you. Hey, Lucy. All right, everybody. I love you guys. Have a great night. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share. And I'll talk to you later.